What basic fact broke your brain? When I was a little kid, my mum would bet me that I couldn't eat my carrots without making them make a snap noise. I was determined to prove her wrong, carefully biting in until snap. Damn it. Let's try the next one. Careful. Careful. Snap. Damn it. I think I was about 16 before I realized she didn't care in the slightest about the bet. She just wanted me to eat my darn veggies. That's actually pretty clever. My mum is a sneaky one. She teaches elementary school and she's still using this bet on kids to this day. When I was 16, I worked weekends at a pharmacy. One morning, right after the store opened, some guy came in, shops around the store for a little while, and leaves without buying anything. Except when he gets to the door, he trips on our rug and falls flat on his face. I immediately stuck my head over the counter to make sure he was okay when he yelled, Those aren't mine! and runs out. I look down on the ground and there's two badly dented 20-ounce beers on the ground. My initial thought was, oh my god, he tripped on those beers. Who put those on the ground by the exit? It took me about an hour to realize what he was actually up to. I grew up pretty sheltered and I never swore. In high school, I heard someone say mofo once and I thought it sounded pretty cool. So I went around calling my friends and even a teacher mofo for a few days before someone finally told me it was short for mother fricker. I got an electric toothbrush for my birthday. I was also traveling with family at the time. I happened to lose my toothbrush and looked everywhere for it. I was about to search through my dad's bags when I hit a side pocket and something started buzzing. Immediately, I wanted to search it and my dad flatly denied it, even slapping my hand away. We had an awkward moment where we didn't make eye contact. I was so mad, but I let it drop. Later that day, I was cleaning out a box from the car when lo and behold, I found my toothbrush. Cold realization washed over me. If it was an electric shaver, dad would have taken it out and shown me. In the top three most embarrassing is when someone casually mentioned that Diagon Alley in Harry Potter was just diagonally. I died a little that day. And then there's Nocturne Alley. Nocturnally. As is often the case with these sorts of videos, the narrator just kind of hears about a whole bunch of dumb mistakes that he's also been making for way too long. In this case, I did actually know about diagonally, but nocturnally sailed right over my head. At a grade school field trip to a local nature trail, we were treated to a scavenger hunt. We divided into teams and drew our list from a hat. My team was to search for 10 objects that were evidence that people have been in the park. All of the lists were similar. We were picking up trash. Pimps. I thought they were just colorfully dressed black men, the African-American equivalent of the 90s swing dancing, zoot suit riot craze. Keep your pimp hand strong meant you literally needed a strong hand for slapping that upright bass. For way too long, I wondered why we never heard about all the other unit's code names, like from A0 to Z9. Why is it only the canine unit? Oh. Mine would have to be the scarecrow. I realized at 18 years old that it's called that because it scares crows. I realized that pitch black meant something was as dark as pitch, and I've helped my neighbors shingle roofs several times before. One day, while driving my mother around town, it randomly dawned on me what my parents were really doing when they locked themselves in their bedroom and told me that they were going to talk about my birthday and Christmas presents. My parents would take naps in the afternoon, on weekends, and lock their bedroom door. They'd also get really mad if you bothered them during that time. It took me a long time to figure out what was really going on. Not me, but my husband. One evening, we were out bowling with friends, and I took my purse to the bathroom with me. My husband was saying, Why are you taking your purse to the bathroom? Don't you trust your friends? While all of our female friends were giving him that look. After a while, it dawns on him why I might be taking the purse to the bathroom, and he says, Oh, that's why mom always got mad when I asked her that question when I was a kid. We were married, y'all. Definitely old enough to know better. Green Herb when I was a really little kid, I saw my dad and his friend, quote, rolling their own cigarettes. It wasn't until college that I smelled what was apparently really good green herb and I said, hey, that smells like my dad's cigarette. Oh. I overheard a co-worker talking about her pet duck and I was fascinated. I asked her questions about her duck, like what it ate, and I expressed fascination that she took it on walks. 
She looked at me strangely when I asked more questions and expressed more enthusiasm for all the things her duck did. She had one amazing duck. It even did tricks. I always brought up her duck in conversations. One day, about six months later, she brought her dog into work. Well, I came to the wrong conclusion, but it was at the time I thought all of my friend's parents had acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. When I was eight years old, I asked my mum how babies are made. She gave me a clear, honest answer. From doing the deed. A few months later, we began taking care of a family friend who was dying from a transmissible disease I mentioned at the start. I asked my mum how someone gets it, to which my mum responded, from doing the deed. So I put two and two together and went to school the next day and burst into tears, telling all of my friends that our parents were going to die because we were all made from doing the deed and that gives you acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. I thought my roommate in college had a live-in girlfriend that I never saw. There were always women's clothes strewn all around his room, pink flip-flops and high heels at the door, and lots of feminine hair and skincare products. One day we were sitting on the couch playing video games when I asked him, Hey, why is it that I never see your girlfriend around? He looked at me and said, I don't have a girlfriend, I've been single since I got here. Oh, whose high heels are those in the hallway? He gave me one of those looks like he couldn't quite comprehend it, and then it suddenly dawned on him. Dude, we've been living together for a year and a half and you haven't figured out I'm trans? In hindsight, it was rather obvious. M and M. M and M. Marshall Mathers. Huh. I realized this last year and I'm 21. I realized on a road trip that hazmat means hazardous materials. I was 23 when I made that realization. Well, once again, the narrator is in their mid-30s and didn't realize this right up until they wrote the script for this video, so consider me dunked on. Embarrassingly enough, it took me a long time to get the K jeweler's every kiss begins with K pun. I legit remember saying out loud, Oh my god, the letter K. Duh. The Christmas only comes once a year joke from the end of The World Is Not Enough. I only got it about a month ago. I'm 23 and I've watched that movie dozens of times. It was like a pin dropping. I suddenly went, oh, I get it, oh dear. English is not my mother tongue, but I've been speaking it fluently for about 15 years now. Some weeks ago, out of the blue, I had the sudden realization that the word movie is just a short form for moving pictures. Mind blown. I was about 23 or 24. I'd been smoking out with friends the previous evening and wanted to clean out my pipe. There were cruddy bits of resin and gunk. If only I had something good to clean this with. Some kind of long, stiff yet flexible wire with a cleaning surface. Wouldn't it be great to have a pipe cleaning tool? A pipe cleaner. Ugh, I'd never put it together that pipe cleaners were meant to clean pipes. I'd only ever used them to make crafts at school and summer camp. A fortnight is 14 nights. Seemed such a weird word before I found that out. In my drama class, we listened to a few songs from a musical at a time and then analyzed them. The first one we listened to was Hair. My teacher would bleep out the swear words by making this loud screaming or whooping sound, and I never understood why. One day we were discussing and I ended up saying, Oh, do you make up that noise to cover up the swear words? And my teacher looked at me and asked what I thought he was doing. I just, I thought you were really excited about musicals. The entire class started slow clapping for my stupidity. A couple of years ago, I realized the Target logo is a Target. My father didn't understand that Cruella de Vil was a play on Cruel Devil until he saw it on a license plate one day while driving me to school. Everything I'm trying to debug. I've delayed myself an entire hour because of one semicolon? Again? Excellent. I worked in a lighting warehouse over the last few summers. We refer to 12,000 watt lights as 12Ks. I'm like, okay, K equals 1,000. It took me until my second summer working there, at 18 years old, to realize that K wasn't just shorthand for 100, it's short for kilo, as in 12 kilowatts. God bless America. When I attended the West End show The Lion King, I genuinely expected there to be giraffes, lions, hyenas, and other such animals on stage. 
My crestfallen disappointment swiftly turned to embarrassment as I had already loudly raised certain logistical queries around this with other members of our party and people sat there in the theatre. What happens if the hyenas get overexcited and just attack Timon and Pumbaa? When I realized, I sat very quietly for the duration of the show. I was 27. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. I only recently realized that Iceland, the supermarket we have here in England, was called that because they mostly sold frozen food. One day when I was a kid, I realized that the word vitamins was a portmanteau for vital minerals. It was embarrassing because it totally isn't that. You're close though. Vitamins come from vital amines, and although not all vitamins are amines, they are all vital. My mum used to say things like, we have to rush because your dad is an old fuddy-duddy and likes getting to places half an hour early. About two weeks ago, I booked a table for 7.30 and told the missus it was 7 so that we were only five minutes late. The penny dropped for me. My mum's friends would invite her to dinner and would always tell her to show up an hour to 90 minutes before so she'd actually be on time. Oh yeah, come for dinner. We are eating at 5.30. Come at 5.30. The narrator has had partners where he's been tempted to pull this tactic before, but then he realized that if he ever got caught in the act, he could potentially be revealed as having lied to his partner for multiple years. Whether or not it was for a valid reason probably wouldn't factor into things. Breakfast is called breakfast because it's when you break your fast. I was 28 and like many people, I realized it from Game of Thrones. Patrick Starr is so stupid because he literally lives under a rock. It took me a while to realize it was called afternoon because it took place after noon. Wait till you figure out the meaning of weekend. April of 2015, I called my parents. Happy anniversary, mum and dad. How many years is it? My mum says, 22. Wait, so you got married in April of 1993? Yes. I was born in August of 1993. Yes. So, technically, I was in there? Yes. <laughs> Anything else you want to share? Oh, I was married once before your father for four months. What? The first symbol in the Disney logo is just a fancy D. When I was a kid, I thought it was some crazy design. Never challenged the idea until much later. When I was growing up, we did a lot of chores around the house, including gathering up everyone's laundry. My dad always used a cloth hanky and has his entire adult life. Gross, I know. And he always keeps one in his back pocket. Every so often, mum would pull out their bed and have us collect all the hankies my dad had stuffed behind the headboard. Literally 20 or 30 of them all gunked up. My child brain thought dad had night allergies and was hocking weird loogies into them. My adult brain realized they were his splooge rags because they used the pull-out method. It was the 70s and 80s and birth control wasn't nearly as advanced as it is now. I just realized the band The Beatles is a play on words with the word beat like a music beat. When my mum told me two days ago that women do not in fact pee out of their hoo-hahs, I'm an 18-year-old male. Washington, D.C. was not in the state of Washington. Only recently found out that pickles were cucumbers originally. I just thought they were another kind of vegetable and that when you pickled something, you were putting it in pickle juice. Back in high school, I knew these two identical twins. I was sitting with them at lunch, either first or second day of grade 9, and at one point I noticed they looked alike. I said something along the lines of, you guys look alike, and one of them was like, yeah, we're twins. I even remember during the assembly earlier that day, I sat beside one of them and I saw her sister sitting somewhere further down, and I was confused. I was on a travel assignment years ago where another co-worker and I sometimes flew to a regional airport together. One flight, the flight attendant made some incomprehensible announcement on the PA just before people started deplaning. My ears were a wreck from the flight, so I had no idea what she had said. As I got off, she glared at me and said sarcastically, Nice. A few months later, my co-worker and I were talking about something or other, and he mentions the time some kid barfed all over the airplane aisle, and I guess I stepped in it that time. Flow Rider, Florida, Florida. 
I realized at the age of 23 that the count from Sesame Street is a multi-level pun. It blew my gosh darn mind. In ancient folklore, vampires were actually obsessed with counting. One of the ways to outrun them was to spill a bag of rice. They'd get caught up obsessively counting the rice grains. So it's like a triple level pun. Huh, I mean, that second comment is just a very cool piece of trivia. See? We're not just here to make you feel dumb, folks. You can see the moon because the sun is shining light on its surface. Just hit me like a ton of bricks when I was about 20 or so. Don't know what I thought before that. Um, some teacher failed at their job. Bill Nye was booed by a bunch of Christians for telling them that a year or so ago, so don't feel bad. Last year at age 42, I realized that Staples sold all the staples you need for your business and that they didn't just pick a random office supply for the name. I figured it might as well have been staplers or paperclips. That someone I knew in my family was a closet green herb smoker. Literally, the person I knew for years had smoked green herb in their closet and always covered it up. I put two and two together when I started to smoke. That donut holes are from the center part of the round donut. I always assumed it was a donut hole, like W-H-O-L-E, and it didn't occur to me until last year. Growing up, my cousin's grandmother had a female friend she lived with. It was kind of an open secret that she was her lesbian girlfriend and nobody cared. I'm now 29 and was recently talking to my cousin about it. My mother, who spent a lot of time with these two women, said, Wait, they were lesbians? Still not clear how this is something a bunch of 12-year-olds figured out, but my mum couldn't. I grew up very poor and way out in the country. One night while visiting some friends for dinner, we got lost and ended up being late. My friend's wife goes to fix me a plate for dinner and she put it in the microwave. It was at this point I realized that she put some corn on my plate. I ran as fast as I could across the dining area and told her to make it stop. She did and asked what was the matter. I then let her know that I didn't want the thing turning my corn into popcorn. Sophomore year of college, it finally dawned on me that one of three off-campus apartment mates was gay when I came back earlier than he had expected one night and saw him on the sofa with another guy. He never gave any hints about his sexuality before then, but I put two and two together when it occurred to me that the only people he ever hung out with were males and that he had no typical straight interests. Late to the thread, but I didn't realize the symbol on Superman's chest was an S. I saw the negative space around the S and thought it was some crazy Kryptonian language. We did an art project in grade school, I think it was probably third or fourth grade, where you'd draw a word you thought described you and add other elements to it. You could use the dictionary or thesaurus to pick a word. I wanted to do something about being smart or sensible, but I didn't think either of those were pretty enough words so I picked the word sensual. My teacher even tried to dissuade me, but I refused to listen. The worst part is I picked it from the dictionary, but didn't look at the definition. I didn't think about it again until I saw all the words displayed a few years later when I was in the sixth grade. At that point, I wanted to die inside. Not me, but my husband didn't learn that meet you there at quarter after means 15 minutes after, not 25 minutes after the hour. A quarter, like 25 cents, not one-fourth. We're in our mid-twenties. I saw a brick on the outside of my school that said Anno Domini and a year. Saw another Anno Domini brick on a friend's church. I loudly proclaimed that the architects for both were the same person. Weeks later, it occurred to me that they were the dates over a hundred years apart. I wish I hadn't been telling people all about that guy Anno Domini for the weeks until I figured it out. Anno Domini means year of our lord, so the date built. Noodles and company is called that because you eat noodles with company. There isn't some other noodle company that the restaurant owns. While some of these have made the narrator feel very, very dumb, there have been a few like this last one that soften the blow and inform us that at least there's someone below us in the ranking of human intelligence. So thank you, commenter. The sixth grade science teacher, Mrs. Parks, asked her class, Which human body part increases to ten times its size when stimulated? No one answered until little Mary stood up and said, You should not be asking sixth graders a question like that. I'm going to tell my parents, and they'll go and tell the principal who'll fire you. Miss Parks ignored her and asked the question again. Which body part increases to ten times its size when stimulated? 
Little Mary's mouth fell open. Then she said to those around her, Boy, is she going to get in big trouble. The teacher continued to ignore her and said to the class, Anybody? Finally, Bill stood up, looked around nervously and said, The body part that increases to ten times its size when stimulated is the pupil of the eye. Mrs. Park said, Very good, Billy. Then turned to Mary and continued, As for you, young lady, I have three things to say. One, you have a very dirty mind. Two, you didn't read your homework. And three, one day you're going to be very, very disappointed. I just figured out a few days why Mary was going to be disappointed when she got older. When I realized that a pancake is literally a cake you make in a pan. Last year I came to the conclusion that Antarctica is named that because it's opposite of the Arctic. My ex cheating on me. What? No, she'd never do that to me. Just because she hasn't been talking to me a lot in the past few weeks and been hanging out with that mutual friend of ours after school a couple of days in the past week and not telling me about it and been getting really odd when I bring that friend up in conversation and getting super paranoid about me hanging out with other girls outside of school. Oh, okay. I guess this is somehow my fault. Huh. When people said they lived out in the sticks, I thought the sticks was a real place, like the Cotswolds or the Midlands. 28 before that particular penny dropped during a conversation with a client. Can you pinpoint the moment that killed your passion for your job? It was a three-day weekend, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and I was already scheduled to work Sunday and Monday. On Saturday, I got a call from work. They needed my telephonic help with something. That didn't require me to go in, so I handled it from home and it took me about 30 minutes. I added 30 minutes to my time card for the work on Saturday, you know, my only day off, and on Tuesday, after his three-day weekend, my boss tells me the Saturday overtime, 30 minutes, was disapproved because I didn't actually come in. So I just stopped answering my company paid cell phone outside of work hours. I started working for Radio Shack as a Christmas employee in 1989. When the holiday months were over, they offered me a full-time job and I took it. For the first four or five months, it was great and I enjoyed coming to work. Then the manager got fired and a new manager took over. At first, he was okay and we got along decently, especially since they'd announced that they were going to move the store to a newly built strip mall where we should see a nice uptick in business. Great! The week of the move, I put in a lot of overtime helping to get the new store set up, putting up shelves, arranging displays, among other things. The weekend we moved, the district manager screwed us. He said he was going to rent a big U-Haul truck and get 15 to 20 people to help us. He did nothing and got nobody, so we were on our own. I worked 36 hours straight, went home for 6 hours sleep, then came back and worked another 12, getting everything moved and set up. The district manager didn't thank me for putting in all those hours and helping. He complained that it took so long to do it and said we were weak. When I went to turn in my time card, my manager didn't want to pay me for all the overtime. He and the district manager tried to convince me to volunteer those hours. When I demanded to be paid, they told me that they might have to let me go because my hours are throwing the store payroll out of whack. I told them that if they wanted to fire me for asking to be paid for the hours I worked, it was fine with me so long as they paid me. After a couple of days of arguing, they agreed to pay me. From that moment on, I didn't give a crap. I started to realize that they didn't care about me and I was just there to collect my check. My moment was when the owners and GM looked at my prostate cancer as a major inconvenience for them. They complained about me being out for surgery and I'd been out less than two weeks. I was back after two weeks wearing a freaking diaper because I was afraid of losing my job because of my illness. Then they expected me to be concerned whether they made a profit. Yeah, that's likely. My dad went through the same thing. He had prostate cancer and used his vacation time for the surgery. The surgery was in the middle of June, and since he worked in a photography lab where all the photos needed to be developed for weddings, there were a lot of them in that summer. His boss was mad that he didn't postpone the surgery until summer was over. His boss wanted him to delay surgery on a cancer that was already pretty developed so that she didn't have to work as hard. I was a little kid at the time that gave no Fs, but now it makes me mad thinking about it. I'm going to assume that these cases come from a certain United States of a major continent. Try getting away with this in the UK or Europe. My previous job. The owner of the company let go of a secretary due to hard times. It's sad but understandable. He then fired her husband who worked the night shift cleaning crew because I didn't want any retaliation. He took away both sources of income from this family at the height of the recession for no reason other than paranoia. The owner would say, we're family here. Sure. I frickin' hate that we're family bullcrap. We're only family until it becomes even slightly inconvenient. 
used to work at a builder's merchant running the outdoor yard of the place entirely by myself. We should be at least two people, three people is ideal. Put up with a lot of crap, such as not one single staff bothering to help when it got busy. And it got busy a lot. And being a doormat by working nine hours straight with no lunch breaks for weeks on end because of lack of staff. Pretty exhausting considering it's manual labor and all outdoors. The bit that got too far was when a health and safety officer showed up one day and decided to write me up for gross negligence of rules even though I was doing exactly what the company told me to do, which then led to me almost losing my job and being on final warning for six months. Bear in mind that I'd never had a single warning before, so this was bollocks. Crap like that makes you realize that you're nothing but a freaking number to these companies and actually going way above what you should be doing for a crap job, which is a complete waste of time. If you'd requested lunch breaks and were denied, that's when you call an attorney. You allowed that to happen. An attorney would have told you exactly what to do for a payday and start looking for a new job ASAP. When I was told to peel the remanufactured sticker off the back of the new instruments we were installing for a customer. Worked in big box retail, managed the credit and memberships being sold. Our store had not been in the green in over seven years. Not only did I take us from the red to the green in seven months, but had us go from number 26 in our market to number three. I wasn't given a bonus because I'd only been in my position for seven months. While cashiers who'd just been there six months or fewer did receive a share. Brought it up to the GM and she said it was just how it worked. Not only that, but she expected more out of me and number three should not satisfy me. I got up, walked out of the office and right out of the front door. They called and texted me for two weeks straight. Even offered me a promotion to lead a higher department. I declined politely. I now manage a store and make almost double what I did there. Thanks for the motivation to move on, old job. For seven years, I had a boss who valued the work people did and didn't care how you arrived at the end of the product. Motivated and innovative employees were recognized and generally received additional responsibility and new challenges. Then came the new boss, who was the textbook example of micromanager and ran the department like it was a 50s assembly line. Watched the amount of time people took breaks, watched the minute people arrived and the minute they left. Achievements were no longer recognized and employees were just cogs in a wheel. If there is no incentive to do anything more than the minimum amount of effort, the minimum amount of effort will be done. Was told they'd be hiring someone full-time with higher pay to do my exact same job and I would no longer be qualified. Knew me apparently wasn't as good as I was. The boss said she forgot how much was involved with a job. Well, yeah, that's easy to do when you give someone else all the work. My boss has told me many times that there's no set arrival or departure time from work, but the general rule is four 10-hour shifts from Monday to Thursday. I've been getting some of the worst sleep of my life, it's getting better and I'm working on it, so I've been coming in at around 7.30 to 8am, which is probably half an hour to 45 minutes after most people. I'm not missing anything because all anyone ever does for the first hour is fire off emails. If I have an early meeting, I'm never late. I have no problem staying later than anyone else to finish work. All my work gets done before the deadline, every time, and I never reject additional work. What does my boss do? Gripes at me for coming in when I do, tells me that that's just because the time clock says I'm clocked in doesn't mean I can bill my time if my computer is still booting up. He's the definition of being penny-wise and pound-foolish. I went from incredibly ambitious to bare minimum effort when I realized how little he valued me since I didn't fit his precise stereotype of what a worker should be, even though I get all of my crap done and it's quality every time. When the CEO sneered at me, should I call your mother and tell her you can't do your job? No one had bothered to train me and I wasn't getting paid. So I took my things and left. Never went back. How about we call your mother because I'm about to have a lot of free time on my hands. Yes, give that final line, sound the air horns, and walk out of the building flipping off everyone as you go. You're better off without that job. Watched as the district manager for GameStop convinced a clearly poor family that their warranty didn't cover their 3DS. I'm pretty sure it did, so I called the hero line or whatever it was to report him. I got fired two months later by him the day before my benefits kicked in. See you in hell, mother fricker. God, I hate reading this. I worked for EB Games in Canada for a bit over a year and the assistant manager did crap like this all the time. Not recognizing warranty by twisting words and playing technicalities out. The district manager would also come in once a week and remind us that our priority was to sell Dre Beats and only Dre Beats. Our store was located in a very poor area and no one was going to spend upwards of $600 on a pair of crap headphones. That's rent for most people. And obviously, we failed every month to sell a stupid amount of said headphones. 
They wanted ten sold a month and we never sold one. We'd get scolded and put down and promptly compared to a store a few kilometers west in a very wealthy area that would double the sales target. I quit when the assistant manager tried to trick an old lady into buying an entire system when she just wanted a gift card for her grandson. Scummy company. Well, my moment came today. Recently, the company I work for took away commission and replaced it with a bonus of a free pair of jeans from the store. The item gets taxed as well, which is fine. Today, we found out we get an item up to $200. The company is American and my store is in Canada. Our dollar is crap, so the prices of the clothes in my store are a lot higher now than before. In the States, that $200 gets you pretty much anything save for two or three styles of jeans and outerwear. In my store, not a single pair of jeans falls into that category. So I contact the DM and ask if we could get the American price, which would mean we essentially get our free pair of jeans. Nope, it's $200 company-wide for fairness. So I asked if I didn't take my pair of jeans if I would still get taxed. Regardless of if I take the jeans or not, I get taxed on the $200. So they took away my commission, replaced it with a bonus structure I can't use, and get taxed on it anyways. When the new guy who relies on me to do his job got promoted. You made the mistake of being indispensable. If you can't be replaced, you can't be promoted. Once I realized that no matter what I did for the company, nothing changed. When I got told that my colleague and I already got paid too much when we asked for a little extra. We're currently paid minimum wage. I had issues transferring store with an old company because they thought I was getting paid too much. Apparently a dollar over minimum wage is enough to choose hiring new, untrained employees over someone who could jump in right away and work efficiently. Retail is stupid. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. I was the general manager of a small chain of retail stores. My boss closed all but one store and let every employee go except for me. Normally we had four employees, not including a manager, working at each store. They weren't doing well and we had to cut down on costs, so I understood, buckled down, and ran an entire store by myself. Not only did he never come up to the only store he owned to check on things, but I wasn't allowed to shut down and leave for lunch breaks, and was too busy to eat there. Then he and his wife started going on these two-week vacations almost every month. She doesn't work, by the way. He came back once and told me he had to cut my pay and needed me to take over purchase orders and do inventory on the entire store every Wednesday. That was it for me. I started sending people to a similar store down the road and found a new job. There's now a for sale sign on his building. I hope he reads this. In short, my boss put more and more responsibility on my shoulders while cutting my pay and taking elaborate vacations because we were short on funds. I never understood why people think it's okay to ask people to do more for less. Yeah, I think what bothers me the most was that he was this huge Christian and would throw up Christ and church and all kinds of stuff to make himself look like a saint when he really was probably the most dishonorable man I've ever met. When they did layoffs, during the recession, so I understand, but laid off the people who cared about their job and worked their butts off and kept the people for whom it was like pulling teeth to get them to do anything. Well, that, and also when I was interviewing for a promotion and the interview was 15 minutes of them telling me how much they loved my work and how perfect I would be for that position, and then ended with, and we're giving it to the VP's daughter. Holy crap, that is so cartoonishly stereotypical of evil retail places that it feels like it should be on the show Superstore found out that the product reps were given a ton of free product to the store for the managers to distribute to the sales team. The reps would even give the managers the option of getting a few display-only models for customers to check out or giving products directly to the sales team for them to describe to the customers. The managers would blatantly lie to the reps and would say that giving them to the sales team would help their sales the most, and then the managers would just take all of it. Then these same managers would blame the sales team 100% for poor numbers at our no commission position. If they're only looking out for themselves, then I'm doing the exact same thing. Both of my mentors, two ladies who saw potential in me that I didn't and helped me turn my life around, were fired, packaged out, within a week of each other. Fired by people who only had started a few months before and then themselves quit a few months later. The company cut out a whole department and transferred their duties to my department. Now we must do two people's jobs for a 52 cent per hour raise and the strict no overtime policy remains. Fast forward three months and the company flies all the managers 3,000 plus from across the US to Florida for a meeting where they rent out an amusement park and have a concert by a well-known artist. Needless to say, I'm now the saltiest of salty employees. 
I worked sales in a radio station. We promoted the heck out of this concert coming up, and usually if the numbers reached that goal, we would get a bonus for it. Usually, a large bonus. We doubled the attendance, easily beating the goal we had, and I received a $10 gift card to Applebee's. Applebee's. Immediately after I got that gift card, I applied for a new job and ended up leaving. When they asked why I was leaving, I decided to be honest and said, when you compensate someone with a $10 gift card to Applebee's for reaching a milestone for a concert, you won't keep many people. I can't believe a $10 gift card to Applebee's is a thing. Jesus. Good on you. Getting my temp contract extended for another six months instead of being brought on permanent, right before they had a brand new training class of permanent direct hires. Their justification for extending? They couldn't afford it. F you, current job. The moment they hired an outside guy and paid him as much as I get to do all the social media work I'd been doing. This is right after a conversation about how great my work has been, and we had a discussion about an increase on my hourly rate due to the extra work. Needless to say, I stepped away from the social media element and they haven't figured out why it's crap now. When I asked for a big fan to be put in our work area to help circulate air, since we were working in 120 degree heat with nothing to move the air around, I was told it wasn't in the budget to purchase another fan. Two weeks later, I found out that not only did no one check the budget or put in a request for said fan, we had two sitting in storage gathering dust. 120 degrees? Who do you work for? Mordor? One does not simply clock in to Mordor. Why don't you just skip the trafficy commute by flying in on the eagles? Have you seen the mileage an eagle gets? This isn't a joke. I overheard one of my supervisors complaining about layoff season because she wouldn't be able to humiliate us and make us cry as often. My boss won't do anything about her. This happened a few weeks ago. My boss told me to go to one of the project leaders and tell him to stop work at a particular project. So I do that. The project leader goes, this is ridiculous, this is a 400k job. To which I was like, Mark told me to tell you, don't shoot the messenger. So the project leader talks to the operation manager, the operations manager comes up to me while my boss is in the room, goes like, John, did you tell the project leader to stop work at a particular project? I say, yes I did. Why? Because Mark told me to. The operation manager turns to my boss, goes like, Mark, did you tell John to tell the other project leader to stop work at this job site? My boss says, no, I did not. There were three other people in the room when my boss originally told me to do this, and those same three people were also in the room at that moment. No one spoke up. Ugh. Most spineless jellyfish bosses would normally just stammer and try to put it down to a misunderstanding, not outright deny giving the order in the first place. Nuts. When I watched every position above me in my department stay open for a year and my boss's boss wouldn't even interview one of us for any of them. Not one. All while complaining that he can't find candidates despite three of us applying for everything. It got to the point where one of us did get promoted. He got promoted by another supervisor that doesn't even work for our department. In fact, he filled every position himself and more or less told our boss to sign the offers. I was promoted to manager and was given no training. Oh, we had a company-wide useless leadership training, but no specific job description or anything. I asked my boss several times, but he was very flaky and vague. So I did what I thought was needed and did a ton of behind-the-scenes work to ensure that our team was running smoothly, worked with our remote team, implemented and improved our internal processes, and dealt with any personal issues affecting team members. I gave them guidance on their careers when they asked, met with team members weekly to assess how they were doing. I met with my boss for my annual review about a year later and he said I was doing a fantastic job and to keep it up. My boss then avoided me for four months. Other direct reports said he was doing the same to them. At our first one-on-one -on -one after my review, four wordless months later, he said, You're not really acting like a manager. I'm going to make you an individual contributor. When I pressed him for specifics, he refused to give any. He was careful not to tell me I was doing a bad job, but just kept saying I wasn't doing what he expected of me. Which, remember, he refused to tell me what he expected or me as well. This was the meeting where I said, F this. At a grocery store. When for two and a half years I warned that someone was going to slip and fall on the faulty loading dock for the trucks because a drip in the ceiling wasn't being fixed by the company or the landlord who owned the building, the drip was landing on the loader, which kept breaking. I griped loud enough, and the solution was to send us pretty much a portable ramp. Since unloading the trucks was a one-person job, having one person drag this ramp around was a hazard in itself. We just couldn't use it. So inevitably, someone slipped and fell on the old ramp. 
and only at that point and some injury payout that was kept private did they replace the faulty ramp that we had. Worked a 12-hour shift, then stayed on an extra hour because it was insanely busy. I received no thanks and was told by management to man up and stay on another hour. Needless to say, I didn't. Damn, sounds like you were in food service. Uh, it was a bar, close enough. Got hired as a technical writer, a job I'd been aiming to get for several years. As it happened, the team I joined was a little bit of a rogue element in the company. They had a lot of their own branding, used different chat clients, had a very different outlook on what our company could or should be doing. Most technical writers usually do online help stuff, but I and my two closest colleagues did tons of non-traditional tech writer stuff. Helped with advertising, user interface copy, wrote and disseminated newsletters for releases and patches. I built and maintained a very popular internal document repository and lots of other cool stuff that I loved doing. Someone I met at the company once told me that enjoying the work that others hate is the best job security, and she was right. I love figuring out how to organize documents, designing templates for Word and InDesign, making cool GIFs to show off how new product features work, and writing directly to customers. About a year and a half goes by, and the manager of the company's tech writing team pulls a bunch of strings and absorbs us into his much larger team. I'm officially cut off from my beloved smaller team, directed to never waste time on internal things like the document repository, and told that newsletters are marketing's job and that online help we'd built over the last year had to be redone in his team's methodology. He wasn't wrong, and a lot of what I did was usually what tech writers do, but gosh darn if it didn't kill the love I had for my job. He flat out told me during our first conversation that his goal was to make my job as boring as possible, and that I would always know what each week would bring. He was right about that, too. What's the worst way you've been rejected after asking someone out? Asked a girl to a dance in high school. She said, What if I have a boyfriend by then? I had a crush on this boy, and as a girl in middle school, you're not supposed to ask the guy out. But all of his friends said, Do it, he'll say yes. So I went up to him in the lunchroom in front of everyone, and he stood there smiling, waiting for it. Then, when I asked, he said, No, are you kidding me? Laughed and walked away. It was all set up as a funny joke, and everyone was laughing. Imagine a stupid cheap movie with those mean high school kids. That's exactly how it went down. Really embarrassing. She said, What? I've, I've been telling people you were my gay friend. I asked this girl out, she started to cry and told me I looked just like her brother that had died in Iraq, and then she showed me a photo of him. Did he look like you? Yeah, he looked like me, it was sort of creepy. When I was about 14, I asked a girl to go out with me. Here's what she said. But you know you're ugly, don't you? I mean, you don't have to say that, you can just say no. Why do you add more? That's just cruel. That crap really hurts when you're a teen. That should have been when you replied, Yeah, that's why I'm asking you. This was back as a freshman in high school, but a popular guy kept asking me out, making a show of it before class started. Eventually, I said yes. He gave me a pitiful look and said, You know I was just kidding, right? If you responded seriously, in any way, Yes, no, I have a boyfriend, I don't want to date anyone, whatever. It was... <laughs> <laughs> Did you think I was serious? <laughs> if you made a joke, they'd play all wounded and hurt and keep playing that they were serious and that you needed to give them a real answer. If you ignored them, it turned into a big game to make you respond. These people suck. I hated all of this BS. It carries all through high school. Near the end of my senior year, I really liked this chick who was into acting, singing, and all the theatrical stuff. Anyway, I thought she was gorgeous. I flirted, made passes, and tried to ask her out, but she would always avoid me. You can actually typecast me as a jock in high school. I played all sports, but didn't have the jock personality. I actually despised those D-bags. Well, I wrote her a note asking her to meet up and whatnot. She declined, so I stopped bugging her. I ran into her many years later in our hometown over the holidays and asked her why she rejected me. Turns out she thought it was all an elaborate prank. Damn kids. Well, the sad part is that after the story that led into this answer, this girl might have been somewhat justified. Sucks to be everyone. Oh, Lord. Mine said, Oh my God, you're too early. You see, I really want to go out with Paul, and I decided that if he hadn't asked me out by next Friday, then I would settle for you. So, could you please ask me next Saturday? Because then I'll know if I have to or not. This was not junior high or high school. I was 32 and she was 30. Both of us were divorced with children. Just to let anyone who asks know, I didn't ask her out again the following Saturday. The other guy never asked her out either. 
I continued to run into her for a few years after this incident, and she became a complete train wreck. I definitely dodged a bullet, but I've always felt sorry for her kids. Oh my god, she's raising future people? In first grade, I told some girl I liked that we should go on a date. Somehow, my gosh darn first grade teacher relentlessly made fun of me for it, and the whole class did too. That really messed me up for a bit. I asked a friend to a movie or something when I was 18. She laughed, didn't reply, just laughed. Later, she asked a mutual friend to tell me there was no chance. Two weeks later, she was at my place asking me to be a date to a party that was coming up and totally into me. I was so confused. You might have really missed out on being pranked there. Good job. You know, my wife has told me a couple of stories about a guy she has a crush on in high school, and when she said it out loud, you could clearly tell the guy was into her, felt mutual attraction, and thanks to her weird behavior, thought that she had rejected him. I think that's the female flip side to all of these. Like, they don't know how to respond to being liked sometimes, and they just insta-reject out of fear. In my wife's case, she had convinced herself that this guy, who was clearly into her, would never be interested in her. I stuttered multiple times while asking her out, and the only thing she said was, fail, then she walked away. I was convinced that the girl was going to come to a movie with me, but she decided that she didn't want to go, so she sent a text saying, I can't go tonight. Later I checked Facebook and there were pictures of her with another guy at another movie theater. This was about three years ago. When I was in high school, I asked a girl out on a date. She accepted, and when the day came, she told me she couldn't go because she got grounded. I went to a movie with a friend. The girl was sitting in the row behind us, with some guy I didn't know. One time, back in the day of AOL Instant Messenger, this girl was talking to me for a few hours. We had been friends for a few years and I'd always liked her, but she didn't know that. Well, this night she was bugging me about who I liked and wanted to know so bad. Eventually, after probably an hour of deflecting the question, changing the subject, or straight up saying it's private, I said, you. And she responds with, okay, well, I have to go now, bye. She ends up not talking to me for a year, and the only reason she did talk to me was because we were partnered up in a science class that next year. I also learned that around half the grade's girls were over at her house that night for a big sleepover. My school was small, and my grade probably had about 30 girls in it, and they all acted noticeably different around me. They wanted to find out who it was so they could embarrass me, as I was a large dude back then and people were making fun of big people. And when they found out it was her, well, I was apparently still the butt of the joke. Middle school was a lot of fun. Uh, Mine said, while laughing loudly, Are you serious? Are you asking for someone else, or... Oh. And now, a year later, I'm used as a joke. Mine said, Do I know you? In the second grade, I built up the courage to tell this girl Casey that I liked her. I only told my friend Daniel how I felt. I got off on her bus stop, three blocks from mine, and I started walking towards her and said, Hi Casey, I... And she interrupted me and yelled, Why did you get off the bus? I don't like you and I don't want you to ever talk to me. Daniel told me everything. Just leave me alone forever. I was pretty broken up about it. I marched right to my friend Daniel's house to kick his butt, but his aunt told me he moved that day. Daniel, if you're out there, F you. High school, my awkward phase. My mother tells me I'm pretty and I finally get up the courage to ask out the cutest guy in my year to the movies. He says, I'll have to think about it, and takes my cell phone number, which I thought was a good sign. We texted a few times, arranged a meet-up at the movies. Get to the day and I'm ready to go, I make myself look all pretty and do my hair nice. I get to the movies, and he's there, but so are all his friends. All of them, including the guy I liked, are laughing at the absurdity that he could ever want to go out with me. Laughing at the fact that I got dressed up. It was all a big prank. I've never been so humiliated. This is the worst thing on here. That's just awful. What a bunch of absolute eggplants. Well, I got over it. It made me a nicer person as well, I think. I tend to look past people's appearances and look on who they are on the inside. I think it was beneficial in the long run. Asked a guy I was crushing on to prom. He said, sure. Two weeks before prom, I heard that he'd asked another girl. Well, I never said yes. Wow, D-bag alert. And weirdly, not the only person in these stories seemingly keeping someone on the back burner as a safety option. At least that's what I assume he was doing. I swear that this wasn't me. A guy I know works at a boutique clothing store and got a crush on this girl that also works in said store. He asked her out and her response was, I don't appreciate you talking to me. My response? God damn. This thread is not boosting my self-confidence. 
In 10th grade for prom, I did a big romantic ask involving our school's marquee, the big signs with interchangeable letters outside some schools, and she said yes. However, the night came, I picked her up, she refused to take pictures with me, barely ate her dinner, and turns out when we got to prom that she had used me to get a ride. We lived on the outskirts of Houston about an hour away. All because she didn't have a car and her actual date, lived out where the prom was and didn't want to drive into town to pick her up. So we got to prom, literally the second we walk inside she runs away and jumps into the other guy's arms. I felt real bad, man. Listen, I don't want to sound like an eggplant or anything, but maybe she only said yes because you made such a big spectacle of asking her out and she felt obligated to say yes. Like, maybe she felt bad rejecting you in front of the entire school. Then afterwards, she couldn't work up the courage to tell you the truth. Then refused to take pictures or eat because she felt guilty? Or maybe she was just a manipulative B-word. I don't know. Honestly, it's not a great thing to make a grand public romantic gesture as a way of starting a relationship. You should only do something like that when you have reason to believe it's going to go smoothly. Otherwise, it's pretty messed up for all parties involved. I'd find it humiliating to face the choice between turning someone down publicly or saying yes publicly and then turning them down afterwards. Mine told me she would rather eat her own tampon. Many tears were shed that night. Met a girl on OkCupid. We did some chatting and some texting. We decided it's time to meet. I go to the spot and I see her. It's obviously her. She makes eye contact with me from about 20-ish feet away and just keeps on walking. I leave, delete her from my phone and never heard from her again. I didn't have an OkCupid account for much longer either. What the heck? You planned to meet up, you knew what each other looked like and she showed up and then walked by? That's cold. At least meet up, hang out and then politely excuse yourself a bit after you've decided that you're completely uninterested. But walking by? What on? Earth. I know, right? What really got me is that I was actually thinner than my pics on the site. My logic was that if she had agreed to meet a 15 pound heavier me, she'd be impressed by the new me. I was pretty floored by it. At least have the common decency to let me down like an adult. I don't know if she was nervous or scared, but if she didn't want to eat dinner with me, I honestly didn't care to find out. I'm not going to play any games. This isn't high school. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. My friend made this girl a card with a poem in it for Valentine's Day, and he asked her out. She said no and laughed at him. It doesn't help that he misspelled beautiful and the poem went, like, roses are red, violets are blue, you are beautiful. We refer to that day as the Valentine's Day Massacre. I ended up having a huge crush on this girl that started hanging out with my circle of friends via a friend of a friend kind of thing. She'd just hang out with us, play video games and talk crap with us, and just generally be a cool girl to be around. We were friends for several months before I started having some stronger feelings for her. I finally got the courage to ask her out. She turned me down in what I hope was an attempt to be nice by saying, I don't think I could look at your face and be happy if I ever slept with you. Was that her way of saying, our friendship is too important for me to complicate it with feelings and intimacy? Although I appreciate your courage in asking me out, I think, for now, a friendship is what I need from you. I convinced myself that that was indeed the case. I ran into her years later and she told me not going out with me was one of her biggest regrets. We ended up going out, drinking too much, and found our way back to my apartment, where we had a great night of crazy one-night fun. I woke up the next morning and she was gone. I never heard from her or saw her again. I guess she really couldn't stand seeing my face after we slept together. Back in high school, I had a girl say something to the effect of, oh god, not another one, after she found out I liked her. I'm sorry about that, and I know it must have been hard, but you have to understand that sometimes this is also really hard for the girl. I don't know her and you didn't specify her tone, but not knowing which of your friends really like you and which ones only want to hook up because you're hot is depressing and annoying after the initial ego boost. My friend had that, not me. I wish. (laughs) I was the awkward one. 12th grade prom, I finally got up the nerve to ask the girl I was dreaming about for like the last four years. She said yes to my astonishment, but says sadly she or her family didn't have the money for a dress. I promptly offered to buy a dress for her and she appeared very happy. After some time, she said, let's rent a hotel room. We can go early and get it, then go home and change. She went with me to go get the room first thing in the morning. She grabbed the key when the clerk gave it to us and said, okay, see you tonight. We'd already planned the limo and paid for it. I found it weird that she wanted it to pick up her first. She said she wanted to meet my parents. Well, I go home and get ready and waiting and waiting. 
The limo never comes and she doesn't answer the phone. I get a hold of my buddy at the prom and he tells me that she's there with some other guy from another school wearing the dress that I brought her riding in the limo I paid for and I'm sure going to the prom I paid for. Needless to say, I have trust issues to this day. A friend of mine asked a girl to dance one night at the club. Her response was, No thanks, I've only had one drink. All my friends said you're too ugly for me to date. I think the worst part of this is that the lady or gentleman in question is either hiding behind their friends to avoid doing the hard work, or it's genuine and they haven't formed their own opinions. Ugh. Let me preface this by saying that I'm a guy. It was middle school and the last few days of 8th grade. After that, I would have gone off to high school. I wasn't really sure on whether or not I was gay or bi or whatever. All I know is that I had a really big crush on someone I've known since 5th grade. After a tormenting few days, I finally got the courage to write the most intricate, most delicate love letter that I'll probably ever write in my life. I don't think it was creepy. It was along the lines of, I really like you. I know it's weird for a boy to say that to another boy, but it's the end of the year and I figured I'd throw caution to the wind. At the very least, I'd know that I tried instead of wondering what if. And I asked him out. I gave him this letter. I told him it was extremely personal. Instead of reading it right there, he took it home instead. Tomorrow was the last day. I couldn't have possibly been more stressed. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. My heart was racing the entire night. Finally, the last day of school comes, and I'm sitting on the stairs reading Ender's Game, waiting for the day to start where he comes up to me. Now, since this is the lobby, pretty much the entire student body is crowded in here, waiting for the bell to ring so we can scatter to our homerooms. Right there, loudly, in front of everyone, he took something personal and made it into a public spectacle. I was shut down in front of the entire middle school and at the same time, outed. I was shocked, mortified, and he didn't even do it nicely or privately. Until right then, he was the nicest guy I've ever known. I didn't cry. I don't think I could have with everyone so silent, watching me like they were. The bell finally broke the silence and everyone else shuffled off. Next year in high school, his friend was in my English class. I don't know how we started the arguing, but he started reciting something that sounded familiar. It was excerpts from the love letter. The guy I had a crush on worked up the courage of a thousand sons to ask out. He had showed all of his friends. Wow, that was incredibly courageous of you. I rejected someone the worst possible way almost 20 years ago, and it still haunts me. Maybe he feels the same way now, if he was a nice guy before, and like me, he was the biggest little coward back then. The first time I ever had a crush on a boy, I invited him to dinner. I cooked it all on my own and everything. I waited 45 minutes before I finally just went to my room and cried. I was 13. Just remember, guys, it is so much better to ask and hear a no than it is to keep pondering over if you should have made a move. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Wayne Gretzky. I mean, that's also a quote from John Wilkes Booth. I'll be leaving now. I had a crush on a girl for all of middle school and two years of high school. After my friend set me up to ask her out, she said yes and we spent a great day together. After I got home, she called me and tells me she's changed her mind. She goes back to her ex and then dumps him a week later. Another mutual friend then invites her over for our 4th of July celebration. I made a custom firework, which you should never ever do by the way, and set it off. The problem was I dropped a spark into the main chamber as opposed to the fuse. What was essentially three flares blew up into my face. I wasn't injured at all, but when I regained composure, all I heard was the girl yelling out to my friend to see if he was okay. In short, blinded by the light, wrapped up like a dink, another runner in the night. She told everyone in my small liberal arts college how awful I was. To this day, I don't understand why. I was completely nice and, if anything, too shy. I always feared a girl doing this to me, which is why I was so shy in the first place. She just destroyed my self-confidence for years and years afterwards. I think ignoring me. That's got to be the worst because it makes you think about trying again. Maybe they didn't hear me. All sorts of possibilities fly through your head. I just want something concrete like, sorry, you're not attractive. Laughter. The laughing is definitely the worst. People really undermine the whole process by saying the worst thing that could happen is she says no. A girl and I were friends in high school and hung out a lot. I liked her but was too shy to ask her out. I was popular and a jock, but overweight and had serious self-esteem issues. Yes, even jocks are human. We flirted and I thought she was giving me the right signs. My crush was the worst kept secret. Everyone knew, even her, but we all just ignored the elephant in the room and continued to be friends until I could work up the courage. On Valentine's Day, I laid a large bouquet of roses and a love letter expressing my feelings and asking her out on her front porch. 
All I got in return was a thanks. No discussion or anything remotely related to the content of the letter. I was too embarrassed to pursue the issue and pretended it never happened. I then found out through the grapevine that she didn't like me in that way. She was actually waiting and hoping someone else was going to ask her out. I played it off, but I was terribly hurt. Ironically, because we were such good friends, everyone expected me to ask her to prom, including her. It was clear she would have said yes, but we'd have gone as friends. One night I was hanging out with one of my best girl mates, and I impulsively asked her to the prom. She was so excited and said yes, even though we'd be going as friends. When word got out that I'd asked someone else to prom, it was a scandal. The other girl never got asked to prom, and I had a fantastic night with my group of friends. She said yes, but the next day I saw her with another man on the playground. Oh, the woes in the life of a first grader. Just for the guys out there, I want you to know that throughout my life, plenty of guys have asked me out for which there was definitely nothing wrong with them. In fact, I was attached to them and would definitely have said yes had I not had a boyfriend already. Sometimes no just means poor timing. Keep that in mind. I got her number when I asked her initially, bragged about it to my friends, and then when I called later, she responded along the lines of, Ew! Wish she'd just said no from the start so I wouldn't have bragged. I'm into taller guys. That crap affects my confidence on a daily basis. I really do hate being a short guy. After a few weeks of hanging out, I finally asked. He said, Sure, we can go out sometime, but you know I'm gay, right? I was so shocked all I could do was say, No. No, I did not know that. In elementary school, all of the girls in my class had a crush on the same boy. A bunch of us got together and wrote all of our names on a paper which read, Circle the girl you liked most. He replied with, I hate all of you. Theme park employees, please share your juiciest horror stories. I worked on a major roller coaster many years ago. Two preteen boys rode in the front seat and were screaming down the first hill. The ride takes a sharp turn there, and one of the kids managed to have his teeth hit the other kid's forehead. They rode for the next two and a half minutes, screaming and bleeding as only a head injury can. Came back into the station looking like everyone in the first section had been in a war. A ride they will always remember. That must have made for an amazing souvenir photo. One time, a bird dive-bombed into the funnel cake frying oil and exploded. We had to fish it out. I used to work at a Sky Coaster ride at a theme park, which is a ride you have to pay extra for that's essentially a giant swing that you have to wear a special harness for. Up to three riders can go at once. Several guests commented that it was the most terrifying ride in the park. Once there was a boy, about 13, who was begging his mum to ride with him. She refused, but said she'd pay for his ticket to go alone. So he did. Long story shorter, he threw up mid-ride and showered chunks of Skyline Chili all over the ride area, including people in line, the guy who records the rides on video, and myself. When we finally got him down, we discovered that he'd also peed himself. So I got to wash the suit before going home. I didn't work there very long. I worked in a water park in a dual park single entrance location of a very common chain of theme parks for about a decade during high school and college. The frequency of adults crapping themselves or pooping in the pool was revolting. Two stories of note. I was working for a party for the employees and their guests after normal park hours one night when a fellow supervisor and I noticed some poopy prints meandering down the sidewalk. One employee followed the trail toward the bathrooms, hoping to find a child running frantically to make it. I followed the trail in the other direction, away from the bathroom, praying that I didn't find anything but the end of the trail. I make it about 15 drips down the path heading away from the bathroom towards the lazy river and look up only to see a gigantic woman built like a house wearing a floral one-piece. She has a giant brown stain on her butt and just streams of liquid chocolate running down both legs. She was just strolling along, not a care in the world. I had to spend hours scrubbing the poopy off a textured concrete surface because some huge lady must have gambled on a toot and couldn't care less that she had buckets of brown stuff piling up in her bathing suit. Another time, a kid was floating around the river and just dropped trow and let her rip. It was one massive, and I mean gigantic, poopy. We had to chase it around the current and scoop it out. It was larger than any baked potato I've ever seen and was girthier than my clenched fist and weighed about as much as a chipotle burrito. Long stories short, never swim in a water park. If a public pool is roped off for maintenance, in my experience, it's 80-20 because someone crapped in it and the pool techs needed to shock the pool with chlorine because of cryptosporidium concerns.
God, the amount of times the local pool I swam in as a kid got temporarily shut down because of a poopy, and the amount of times that I just jumped back in ten minutes later after the all clear is making me feel gross. Still, every natural body of water is filled with number one and two, so I guess you just can't win. Employee comes to work one morning after partying all night. Nobody noticed that she wasn't 100%. Security guys later said she seemed fine. She gets to her station on an elevated platform, doesn't follow procedures, and falls about three stories and dies right before gates were supposed to open. What procedures should she have followed that would have prevented this? While the ride was being test run, she left her post for some reason and went out on a restricted catwalk. She was well aware that this was an off-limits area. Nobody knows why she decided to do that. Witnesses said she was bending over like she was trying to pick up something when she lost her balance and fell. She was probably trying to throw up. Ended up throwing herself up all over the pavement. I used to work at Knott's Berry Farm in Southern California. A little kid went to ride the roller coaster Silver Bullet, a somewhat fast coaster with lots of twists and a couple of loops. I was one of the guys who checked the lap belt and whatnot before the ride took off. The kid looked scared but seemed like he was with his older brother and his friends. All of the kids seemed to be a few years older, and he probably didn't want to look like a chicken. The kid straight up pooped himself. It made the seat extremely moist and definitely smelled of number two. As you got off the ride, you could see liquid dripping down his leg as he rushed off. People in the back of the line didn't really know what was going on, but the front of the line, as well as this kid's brother and friends who just got off too, definitely knew. Poor guy. We had to shut down the ride for about two hours to sanitize it, but played it off as technical difficulties. Former Disney World cast member here, here are some stories. While working at Club Cool, some father dropped his daughter's pants and let her squat on the floor. I had a standoff with a guest for three hours in the Mission Space gift shop because he was trying to steal vinyl mations. Got told a couple of times that I ruined someone's vacation, and I met Warwick Davis. I worked on the cleaning crew at Soak City, Knott's Water Park. Once I was mopping the bathroom and a dad and his kid were using the same stall to pee in, and the kid says, Daddy, why is your pee-pee so big? And the dad just laughed and told him his would be that big someday. You could tell he was proud of his junk at that moment. Also, a little known fact is that the women's bathrooms are ten times nastier than the men's. People usually consider men slobs, but girls absolutely trash the bathroom, peeing all over the place, leaving sanitary napkins all over it, and other stuff. Also, I wouldn't recommend going into the wave pool or community pool. We frequently found number twos, sanitary napkins, and other stuff floating in there all the time. Volunteered at a fair one summer in my old town. Some mentally deficient guy got caught tickling his pickle in the haunted house while one of the carts going through the ride rounded the corner and saw him in all his glory. I get away with this all the time. I just tell the policeman that I was pretending to be part of the ride, because seeing me spanking the mule is horrifying. When I was little, I went to Legoland. I was so excited that I ran up and tried to hug a statue made of Legos, and I cut my eye. And on that day, everything was not awesome. I worked at a crappy theme park for three months in my teens. One morning, I got to my ride and there was blood everywhere. Feathers, too. So I did my walk around and there's half a goose. It took three maintenance guys two and a half hours to find the other half. Well, now I know where the company Christmas dinner came from that year. I'm kidding. Owners of these places don't even do things that nice for their employees. I'm not an employee, but as a kid, I went to a local amusement park that also had a water park inside it. I was running around a circle that was basically a huge circle of water cannons. Now, most of them had a foam tip at the end, but I happened to run past the only one where it had worn off while some 14-year-old idiot flung it up as hard as he could. It smacked me square in the mouth and knocked me out cold. Since these were in a circle, they just put a drain on in the center so they could run them constantly. My lifeless 8-year-old body got ragdolled into the center and the water diluted the blood so it looked basically like I'd died and bled out. They shut the park down and had to life flight me out of there. Apparently it looked bad enough that the local news was even reporting that I'd died at first, but in the end I just had to get eight stitches above my upper lip, and now I have a scar and can't grow facial hair in that spot. I operated rides for two years. Two moments stand out. The scariest moment I had was when lightning struck a utility pole below me. My position on the ride was about 50 feet up. It knocked out power to my ride and forced me and my supervisors to unload the ride in the middle of a lightning storm. The second was a guy who was very upset that I wouldn't let his kid who was a foot under the height requirement ride. 
I told him no early in the day, but one of my co-workers let the kid ride while I was on break. The family comes up later and the father, who was noticeably intoxicated, jumped two gates and over the tracks to threaten me with a knife. I called security and he ran. Kings Island Ride Operator here. A kid fricking jumped in the water at one of my rides, Congo Falls, going after a basketball after I denied him permission. I saw him go in and I pounded the e-stop and called it in. Police showed up, security, all of my supervisors, and the fricking kid got away before they got there. So the little jerk caused a bunch of people to get stuck in the ride while we explained the rule about the water. Over at Extreme Skylifters, it's like a ripcord type ride where you swing back and forth on a long cable, somebody got sick. Literally hurled about five gallons of their stomach contents back and forth over a 150 foot flight lane. There was so much fricking spew. We had to call park services to get enough Voban, the absorber, and you could smell it throughout the whole area. While working at Six Flags, maintenance was working on our larger SLC boomerang. The guy was guiding the car back into the station, but didn't look to make sure the floor was back in position. He stepped back where the floor wasn't and fell a solid 15 feet back to the ground. The best part of the story was him looking around, realizing he was in a restricted zone and putting on his neon vest before getting up off the ground. Worked for Disney World's 2005 college program. The full costumed characters aren't allowed to talk, ever. Nearing the final days of the internship, several of the characters would whisper into children's ears variants of Only you can hear me. Help me. Goofy will hurt you. Etc. Other than that, um, there was a crap ton of self-deletion happening at the happiest place on earth. If you're a guest, are hungry, and don't wish to pay Disney's exorbitant prices for food, just lie to a cashier and say you dropped your food or something. Company policy is the guest is always right. Employees are never allowed to argue with a guest. They'll know you're full of it. Oh, and if a cast member ever says to you, Have a Disney day, this is the secret way of saying F you. The older hotels are riddled with asbestos, though this has likely been changed by now. And with few exceptions, every face character is a major jerk. Oh, here's something I witnessed. At a local park, there's a slide called the Triple Dip. The slide lives up to the name and dips three times. A really small kid rode down at once and just started rolling and doing backflips because he was too small. At the end of the ride, he basically just got up and walked away, acting like nothing had happened. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. I work in the games department at a major amusement park. I'm in upper management, so I've been around a while. A horror story? I was walking around the park, we call it taking a lap, and checking on all the different area supervisors to make sure they're all set. I get into the children's area and see a game that has about 10 guests waiting to play, but no associate working. So I hop in and start helping guests. After about 10 minutes, they all leave. So I'm teed off because there should be someone working the game, but there isn't. I call the supervisor and prepare to chew them out. He tells me that there should be two associates working there at the moment. So I start looking around, knowing that they're in trouble now. Eventually, I climb the ladder to the attic where we keep the stock for the game. I found the two associates. The guy was mid-thrust when I blurted out, What the actual frick? The two were doing the deed in the attic of a game in the children's area. I immediately called security and fired them both. Then I had the supervisor spend the rest of his shift working that game. I worked at an aquarium once. One day this man came in with his infant son and started holding him over the shark tank and pretending to throw him in like an idiot. Surprise, surprise, he then drops the kid in the freaking tank. The kid smacks his head on a rock and starts bleeding in this huge tank filled with sharks. A few people quickly jumped in and saved the kid from being eaten. Goes to show that some people should have just been a stain on the sheets. I worked a roller coaster park, and whenever people would complain that they were lost or had to go to the bathroom, I'd get them on the path to the really expensive bathrooms. I miss playing roller coaster tycoon. Free soda, ten dollar bathrooms. You monster. My brother and dad were always pulling that crap, charging out the wazoo for bathrooms and maps, drowning unhappy guests, removing footpaths to trap and confuse, making coasters fly off the tracks. I love that game. The narrator is just glad that some people are as evil as he was when he played that game as a kid. But I will say that I wasn't even doing it to win. It just made me feel powerful and brought me joy. Back when I worked at a relatively large East Coast theme park, we had what many called the craziest shutdown anyone had ever seen or heard about. 
The ride I was working was a dark ride, a motion simulator that followed a track and had 3D projection seats. I was closing in the control room that night where we would dispatch ride vehicles, RVs, and monitor ride cameras and ride control screens. Over the headset, I heard that an intoxicated male couple was coming up to ride. Okay, fair enough. As they were getting on, they were acting slightly belligerent, so I was informed to watch them through the ride by the loader. In scene one, the ride has 11 scenes they began to make out. Fair enough, it happens all the time. I was narrating it over the headset since it was a slow night and we were all shooting the crap. In scene three, I saw their hand moving due south, and the next thing I know is that they're standing up in the RV. At this point, I depress the emergency stop and all the ride lights come up with the RVs stopping in place. I then call the ride down, explaining the e-stop is due to a drunk couple standing up. Here's where it gets interesting. They decided to slip their way out of the lap bars and begin climbing out of the RV. I get on the mic, telling them to please return to your sleigh. They're also called sleighs. Little did I know, I selected all call on the touchscreen for the ride mic, and people down at the ride entrance and passers-by were randomly hearing me yelling, please return to your sleigh. I scan the monitor, attempting to find them in the ride area, and cannot for the life of me find them. At this point, the entrance host calls control to ask what the heck is going on. I explain, and he busts out laughing. I hear my supervisor's keys jingling as she runs up to the exit platform, as she's laughing from the call over the radio about a drunk male couple standing up and climbing out. Once she arrives, we do a ride evac so we can reset from the east stop and walk to the track to find the culprits. After about 30 minutes, we can't find them and give up, and start cycling the ride again before going back up. We checked the control screen to see if there'd been any ride doors opened recently, and none had since that morning when maintenance was clearing the ride for operation. At close, we all had to fill out witness statements for security, and we all had a good laugh. The next morning, maintenance tells us they found two protection wrappers in scene 3, the scene that they escaped in. To this day, we have no idea where the heck they ended up. So in short, a drunk male couple escaped the ride, did the deed, and were never seen again. I worked at a water park. It was towards the end of the day, and I was pushing the tubes down at the top of the slide. People started looking at me funny and looking around strangely. I started hearing people talking about number two, but I dismissed it as nothing. Then someone came up to me and told me to look at the platform below us. I looked down and what do I find but a big pile of brown neatly placed on the middle of the stairs. I worked at a low-grade park mainly known for their go-karts for two years. The horrors were in the many. We constantly had kids purposely trying to hit you with carts. I witnessed one kid hit my co-worker at full speed. My co-worker tried jumping over the cart at the last minute, but that was the worst possible action. His knee ended up hitting the kid in the head and knocked him out, going full speed into the wall. My co-worker then flipped a few times, finally landing on his face. When all was said and done, two people were hauled off in an ambulance, one with a concussion and the other with a broken nose and cheekbone, topped off with some busted teeth. My favorite was when a group of rich guys came through and started making bets on who would win each race on the go-karts. The same guy won twice and was quickly up about a grand. So one of his friends pulled me off to the side and asked if there was a way to make him lose. What people generally don't know is that there's a control panel which controls the speed of the car remotely. This gets used if someone is getting too rowdy or breaking the rules or something of that nature. So I told him about the control panel and he offered me a hundred bucks to make sure that the guy who was winning took last place. I agree and he goes off to entice this guy into another bet. This time he bets him a grand that he'll take dead last. The guy was bold. He wasn't just going for his money back, he was going for everyone's money. The ensuing 12 laps were the best of my career at that park. Every time this guy got alongside someone, I brought him down a bit. Every straight way, I would drop his speed by about 5 miles per hour. By the end, this guy was furious. He paid up and stormed out of the park. Just because you're the best, it doesn't mean you'll win. The smartest will usually find a way to win. I worked at a certain park for two summers. The stuff I saw made me never want to come back as an employee or a guest. I'm going to keep this vague for multiple reasons, but you'll probably guess where I worked. The biggest horror story came from the fact that I spent two of those years in fear of losing my job every single day. Food employees were required to sell a certain product to every person who approached the counter. It didn't matter if they just wanted a cup of free water or had already had 10 out of each item. We had to try to sell the product to them. The problem came in that there were secret shoppers checking in on this. If they caught an employee not asking customers about the products, the employee could be terminated on the spot. I watched multiple friends get fired because of this. My second year, I had a management position. I thought this would fix the fear. I was wrong. If I or an employee under me didn't sell this product, I would be demoted and transferred to another area. 
Now I had to make sure that my co-workers were upselling also. My advice from working here? Avoid holidays, go early in the week, and learn which rides are the most popular because they will have the longest lines. When the ride operators tell you to empty your pockets, fricking do it. I'm not kidding. I can't tell you how many iPhones, watches, earrings and stuff I've seen fall while the ride was going. Even a wad of hundreds. And it's a really long procedure to retrieve the items. We actually have to shut the entire ride down because you didn't listen. And everyone in line gets super teed off for having to wait more than they already do. Okay, but you pretended that you didn't find the wad of hundreds, right? I'm just saying, you keep that stuff and punish the presumably rich D-bag for his non-compliance, and get that same rush of power the narrator felt whilst drowning his roller coaster tycoon guests. I was a scare actor, a walk-around, at Six Flags theme night for Fright Fest a couple of years ago. I was in costume and heavy makeup. The guests seemed to forget that the actors were actual people and not statues that they can do whatever the frick they want to with. My hair was pulled, and I was often touched inappropriately. Also, people seem to think it's funny to show up to a theme park completely wasted, so I was thrown up on a couple of times. But by far the worst experience in my short time of employment there was when I scared this jerk's girlfriend to the point of tears and peeing herself, and then he punched me in the gut. Not sure if this matters, but I'm a female and my costume made no point to hide that fact. I could have retaliated physically, but I would have likely been fired, so all I could say was, thanks, kind stranger and alert park security. He was thrown out of the park along with his wimp of a girlfriend. I'm sorry, but don't come to a fricking fright fest if you don't want to be fricking frightened. Last year, I was at the Pleasure Pier in Galveston. They have a log flume ride relatively close to the entrance, and I was there to witness the most disastrous throw-up broadside I'd ever seen. As the log was coming close to the drop into the water pool at the bottom, there was a kid in front who was obviously not doing so great. As the log tilted forward and rushed down, this poor kid blew chunks in the front seat. But that wasn't the end of it. Apparently the wind, coupled with the moving ride, blew stomach chunks into the faces of seats 2, 3, and 4. It was terrible, but absolutely amazing. I worked for a major theme park in Orlando while in high school hosting a children's show and managing the nearby kiddie coaster. At the children's show, we were never allowed to break character. One day after a show, the father of a five-year-old boy told me to explain to his child that everything here is fake. I didn't break character. The father kicked a trash can, screamed, and said he would sue me and threatened to beat me up. He was ejected and banned for life. One of my employees, a high school girl, came into work wearing an eye patch. In front of guests, she told another employee that she had to wear the eye patch because after going down on her boyfriend, she didn't wash her face and woke up the next morning unable to open her eyelid. She had to go to the ER and they had to cut her eyelid open. She was suspended when guests complained about her telling the story in front of their children. I also had to fire a middle-aged woman for eating gummy bears that were soaked in vodka while she was operating the kiddie coaster. What small symptoms led to massive health issues for you? I owe my life to my barber. When I was 17, he noticed a mole on the top of my head. He said I should get that looked at. Two things could have happened here. One, I could have brushed it off. Two, he didn't have to say anything. Anyways, I went to get it checked out and ended up having it cut out with a scalpel. Turns out it was cancerous, but at the very early stages. They did a little more cutting and were able to get everything out. Almost 20 years ago, and life is good. Anything that's persistent. If it's not going away, it's not just anything, and it needs to be looked at. Persistent, raging heartburn. I was young and dumb and uninsured, so I put it off. I put it off for nearly three months, by which point I was subsisting on plain yogurt and lentils and still having extremely painful bouts of heartburn and emptying my guts into the toilet. I'd lost a lot of weight and was consistently exhausted and in pain. I finally went to the doctor. It was a raging case of H. pylori infection. It was cleared up with antibiotics, but my doctor warned me at the time that I'd probably caused irreversible damage to my stomach and digestive system by waiting so long. She was right. Within a year, the heartburn was back along with nausea and emptying my guts again. I essentially gave myself a chronic disease by ignoring the initial infection. Moral of the story, if it keeps coming back, don't ignore it. What could have been treatable before will turn into something worse. Increasingly painful cramps and nasty PMS symptoms in general. The family doctor attributed the change to age and just wouldn't take it seriously. After a year of complaints, the doctor prescribed birth control pills, which did nothing. After two years, I finally lost it and cried in her office. The cramps had gone from, hmm, this is a bit more than usual, to full-on, what-the-frick-8-out-of-10, white-knuckling, spewing pain level. 
I asked to please be referred to an OB gin. When the gynecologist examined me, he also did an ultrasound in the office. He took one look at the screen, told me I could dress and he'd be right back. When he returned, he was carrying his surgery booking schedule. A few weeks later, I had a total hysterectomy and bilateral salpingectomy, my tubes out. It would usually take up to a year to book that surgery, but he said he absolutely had to find me a spot. He was horrified I hadn't been seen much sooner and described my uterus as more tumor than healthy tissue. It looks more like a raspberry than a pear. Fortunately, it was just benign fibroids, but it taught me a lesson. If something hurts, get help. Yell if you have to. Cue the narrator and all the listeners frantically checking out their recent aches and pains. Also, a raspberry-shaped uterus is one hell of an image. Just if anything suddenly changes without any reason. I think everyone should take the time to really know their own body. All your own little lumps and bumps and processes. Everyone is different, so you can never really rely fully on what experience someone else has had with an illness. If something starts being different with no obvious reason for it, get it checked. Better safe than sorry. I realized this when I was 18. A seemingly healthy 18-year-old woman, and one day, my periods just stopped. I thought nothing of it, because, you know, no periods equals yay! A year later, I had received a stage 4b cancer diagnosis. In my particular case, my periods stopping was the first physical symptom I'd had. Other, more obvious symptoms came much later, but it was extremely likely it would have been detected a lot faster if I'd gone to the doctor and investigated why the periods had stopped in the first place. I'm 11 years clear as of April the 10th. I was much taller than the rest of my family. They're all around 5 foot 5, but I was 6 foot 5 by high school. We always joked I was a freak or won the genetic lottery. I went to my father's doctor for a physical. He noticed the swelling in my hands and ran a blood test. Turns out my growth hormone levels were about three times the normal amount. I was diagnosed with acromegaly. Got an MRI which showed I had a tumor on my pituitary gland. Got it removed and was feeling better after a few years. Isn't that what Andre the Giant had? Yep. The biggest difference between acromegaly and gigantism is timing. His condition probably started at a very young age. My two-year-old daughter, with hindsight. She'd lie on her left side on the floor randomly during the day. She walked with a wide step and finally multiple diagnosis for constipation. Abdominal embryonic rhabdomyosarcoma. After 54 weeks of chemotherapy, strolling through an unimaginable medical hell, she is four and almost a year in remission and hard to keep up with, like she's discovering everything again pain-free for the first time. My sister started to get frequent migraines just after she turned 22. Frustratingly, she did look into it. They happened more and more often. She went to the doctor who waved it off as stemming from stress. Her husband had just been sent to Afghanistan. My mom pushed for a CT scan, which the doctor said was unnecessary. My sister went home without any kind of prescription and a suggestion to come back in a few months if it persisted. Well, a few weeks later, she had a massive seizure. Got taken to the emergency room where the doctors discovered a massive tumor in her brain and diagnosed her with a rare form of brain disease. She died within a year. My mom had some light, like one or two drops three times a year, spotting. For context, she was well past menopause. She mentioned it to her GP and he sent her for a test. Uterine cancer. We caught it at stage one before it spread, so was able to have a hysterectomy without needing a chemo or radiation therapy. Thank Christ her small and seemingly insignificant symptom was checked out. I don't think you'd classify this as an illness, but I would clean my ears regularly. Yet whenever I went to the doctors, they always said there was too much wax and couldn't see anything. My ears tended to hurt frequently and I had a hard time hearing for years. In high school, I went to a doctor who, as usual, checked my ears. Instead of just brushing it off and saying I needed to clean more, she decided to do a total flush. Took two to three hours total to get both ears cleared, and when we were done, she discovered I had an ear infection that was most likely a year old. As a result, I can't hear well out of either ear, but that ear in particular has more hearing loss than the other. We also discovered why I had such an abundance of earwax. We'd already figured out I had hyperhidrosis, an overactive sweat gland, and that also caused my ears to make more wax. I've been instructed never to use Q-tips again, which just compresses it all to the sides of my ears. I go to see a doctor once a month to have them flushed. So, had we just had a doctor flush my ears probably five years sooner, I wouldn't have had such hearing loss. I started craving iceberg lettuce like you wouldn't believe. Like I'd wake up in the middle of the night and go to the fridge just to eat handfuls of lettuce. At my worst, I was eating an entire bag of lettuce a day. No dressing or toppings, just munching on it like it was popcorn at a movie theater. Finally decided I should drag myself to the doctor for a few blood tests, assuming I was a bit dehydrated or vitamin deficient or something. 
My hemoglobin was 5 when it should be 13 to 16 ideally. My ferritin, iron stores, level was 1, which is literally as low as the test goes. I went straight from the doctor's office to the hospital to be admitted for two blood transfusions and an IV iron infusion. The hospital staff couldn't believe I'd been walking around and even working overtime with a level that low for months. Within 24 hours of my blood and iron transfusions, my lettuce craving went away. This happened to me too. My ferritin level was like 3. I craved sand, not lettuce. All I wanted to eat was sand. I never did, but believe me, I almost bought a bag of it. All I could think was, this is so weird, I'd better not tell anyone. Well, lo and behold, I got sick, autoimmune disease, but didn't know it at the time, and I had blood drawn, and I found out I'm severely anemic. Sand craving suddenly made sense and went away when my iron level was corrected. I feel like these are two extreme ends of a body's reaction. Eating lettuce, which is high in iron, makes sense. Sand, on the other hand, how much would you eat before your body realized this wasn't good? Bizarre. My right knee had been slightly funky for a couple of years. I'd originally noticed it after I did a bad tackle playing soccer, landing on my knee. I presumed it was just going to be a niggle that I was going to have to deal with for the rest of my life. It didn't hurt or anything, but what was funky was that you could put your finger on the inside of my knee and as I compressed and extended my knee, you could feel something clicking past tendons and soft tissues. After a number of years, it seemed like there was a bit of swelling around my knee, and during some downtime from work, I decided I should finally see a doctor about it. I told him about the clicking and showed him. His face isn't something I will forget. It was just disbelief, and he said, Well, that's not something I've ever felt before. Sent me off for an x-ray and ultrasound. Turns out I had osteochondroma, abnormal bone spur, on the inside of my knee, and the tendons and so on were literally slipping one side to the other as I bent my knee back and forth. The reason I should have looked into it sooner is because before I got a chance to see the specialist and book in for a surgery to get it removed, the spur punctured something in my knee. It caused a lot of swelling and excruciating pain. Straight to emergency, admitted straight away, and there were considerations about operating that night. In the end, they sent me home after four days of rest and observation, and I got it removed a couple of weeks later, with no major issues. At the time, the specialist noticed that sometimes these things can be genetic and appear in other places in the body. I have a weird clicking in my right foot at the moment that I have no explanation for, and it's starting to get slightly painful. I should probably go to see a doctor. Not me, but my nine-year-old son. Last summer, he complained about leg tiredness and slept a lot. Our pediatrician couldn't find anything wrong with him. Fast forward to January 2017 and suddenly he's constipated and his bladder is retaining enormous amounts of urine. We took him to the local children's hospital and they felt that his constipation was keeping him from releasing urine. So they hit him with gallons of Miralax mixture to get him moving. He pooped quite a bit, but nothing really changed. After a week of this at the hospital, my wife lost her mind on the hospital staff and demanded that they think outside the box. The neurology department came and did an MRI and they found that he had a fatty film at the base of his spine which presented as a tethered cord. They operated immediately. Unfortunately now, the damage is done. My son no longer has bowel or bladder function because of the nerve damage caused by the tethered cord. So we have to use a straight catheter on him six times a day and keep his bowels with stimulant laxatives and enemas. We'll be entering a clinic in May where they'll run a series of daily x-rays and enemas to arrive at the mixture we'll need to use going forward. Poor kid will have to live with this for the rest of his life. My wife and I are sick over it. If the issue had been caught sooner, he might not have had to deal with this. If we had waited longer, it's possible he could have lost the use of his legs. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. Not me, but my childhood best friend. She'd had this thing where her hand would spasm. It was kind of like a hand tremor. I just assumed that it was a tick. Since I have a similar one, my knee bouncing up and down, when I get nervous. Once I asked her about it and she said that she had pins and needles, so I also considered that she might just be shaking it off, even though the tremors were obviously an involuntary movement. That's really all there was, there were no other symptoms. She was fine for a really long time and then suddenly, she just rapidly declined within the space of 24 hours. We were in class when she went down and started seizing. Just as quick as she'd gone down, she was awake again and fine. My teacher took her to the nurse and the nurse called her parents. I've had to work hard to try and not be angry at the fact that her parents chose to take her home that night instead of taking her straight to the emergency room. She had a headache, so they gave her ibuprofen and put her to bed. She died sometime in the night of an undiagnosed brain tumor. Often, brain tumors are misdiagnosed as psychiatric issues. So if you notice a rapid decline in your mental health or stability without any clear reason, or even with a reason, get a scan done.
If you have pain in your ball bag, don't mess around. Seek medical attention immediately. I had testicular torsion and got lucky. A lot of men have lost one or both to this. I lost one of mine to it when I was 12. Just woke up in the middle of the night in severe pain. Felt like I was being kicked in the jewels repeatedly and they were swollen up huge. My parents, for some reason, decided to basically wait it out for almost two days before they took me into the hospital. I had surgery that day. The doctor said if I'd come in right away, they would have saved them both. And if they'd waited another day, I would have lost them both. So now I have one big one that I call the wrecking ball. I experienced pain in my left shoulder, the trapezius muscle, whenever I consumed alcohol, which for me was an infrequent beer. It was odd, but not too concerning since I didn't drink very often. Turns out I had Hodgkin's lymphoma and the pain in lymph nodes on the consumption of alcohol was a symptom seen in only a very small percentage of cases. Less than 5%. This video is probably going to set off a whole bunch of our hypochondriac viewers. I know I for one will probably be hypersensitive about any pain I feel while drinking after that one. My first friend was a Finnish carpenter and was hand sanding in a deep shelf area and got a splinter, more like a sliver of wood, into the cuticle of his pinky. It was pretty fricking big and he was like, it'll work its way out on its own. So he left it alone and a red line started to move along his arm from his pinky up into his armpit. He finally got convinced to go to the doctor and it turns out the red line was an infection traveling along his vein. Had he not gone to the doctor when he did, they said that the infection would have ended up in his heart and would have been extremely life-threatening at that point. The second, my best friend was in the hospital and eventually he ended up passing. But all the stress of him in the hospital and continuing on with his passing gave me a gnarly cramping and waking up to use the bathroom like every hour or two. And not only that, but waking up almost crapping myself and then spending more and more time on the crapper each time. Like having the urge to go without being able to go after initially going. Long story short, ended up with a pretty severe case of Crohn's disease and ended up having some pretty serious six-hour surgery to remove part of my intestine, bladder, and colon. Yay! Not me, but my wife. She had a rare liver disease that sprung out of nowhere when she was 23. Her initial symptom wasn't jaundice, yellowing of the eyes or skin, like liver diseases tend to start showing themselves with, but extreme itchiness. She figured it was just really dry skin. Turned out to be PSC, primary sclerosing cholangitis, but she's two years post-transplant and doing great. My dad has a lot of moles, and my mum forced him to go to the dermatologist because he hadn't been in years. She was worried about a few of the big moles that she thought might be getting bigger. The dermatologist pointed one out and asked if that was one they were concerned about, and no, my mum said that one actually seemed like it was getting smaller. So why would she be concerned? Doctor informed my parents they were doing a biopsy right there and then and cut a 1.5 inch long chunk out of my dad's back. It was melanoma. The really bad skin cancer. It turns out if a mole is getting smaller, it probably is because the immune system has a reason to attack it. The melanoma was only stage one because the dermatologist caught it so early. Dad's doing fine now, this was eight years ago. He's had another mole removed in the past few years and goes to that same dermatologist twice a year because he has quite literally hundreds of moles and freckles. My mum also checks on his more concerning moles pretty often and if she thinks they look strange, off to the dermatologist he goes. The standard for when to be concerned about moles is A, B, C, D, E. If a mole is A, symmetrical, the border is not well defined, if the color is odd, like black, blue, red, or white, if the diameter is larger than the diameter of a pencil, or if the mole is evolving, book an appointment with your local friendly dermatologist, and take a picture of suspicious moles so you can keep track of any changes. And finally, if you have a family history of skin cancer, or fit a lot of the risk factors, even if you aren't concerned about anything in particular, consider booking an appointment if it's within your means to do so. This was actually my mother, but it's good to know if you're a woman or no women. If you've been through menopause and your period comes back after over a year, get it checked out. It's probably nothing, but it can also be something. My mother is fine, fortunately. Not me, but my grandfather. He had trouble breathing for a long time, nothing horrible, just shortness of breath, heavy breathing, etc. But he had to take care of my grandma. He went to the hospital when he started coughing, a dry cough, unable to stop. They diagnosed lung cancer, and he died within three weeks. The doctor told us that if he'd come earlier, they might have been able to save him. I was in my eighth grade, and I vividly remember the day I'd noticed that I couldn't see properly with my right eye, even with my spectacles. And I thought that maybe I needed to get my eyesight checked because the power of my glasses might have increased. I didn't give it much importance because I had exams, and after four months, when I finally went to get my eyes checked, the doctor informed me to go to a bigger hospital because he felt it wasn't normal. 
I went to a specialist eye hospital and they informed me that I was diagnosed with glaucoma and I had lost almost 90% of my vision in my right eye. Intraocular pressure, IOP, in the eye that should have been below 21 was 70, which is insanely high, and it was starting to affect my left eye as well, where it was 23. They didn't know why I had glaucoma, because it's very rare at that age. I had to get operated in my right eye immediately, because medication wasn't controlling the IOP. I missed half of the classes in my 9th grade, and then finally, I had to get operated in my left eye as well in my 10th grade, right before my final exams, to control the condition. I wish I could have been more careful and went to the doctor immediately. This whole grouping is like the dark hole of WebMD. I had problems walking as a child and had a big role in my gait. My parents and the doctor thought it was a foot problem, so I was taken to a podiatrist and given orthotics, which helped. However, this didn't fix my pronated leg. Doctors then said I had growing pains, so my parents ignored the pain for a while, especially since I never really had too many problems playing footy and cricket. I guess I just learned to put up with the pain. After 18 years of pain in my legs and feet, I had a physio figure out that my hips didn't line up and that it was highly likely that I suffered from hip dysplasia during birth that wasn't corrected. My right knee and foot are ruining themselves now as a result of my right leg being shorter than my left. Well, that's some family guilt to go around, I suppose. Although the fact that multiple doctors were initially unable to correctly diagnose you hints that this was a tough one to catch. Rough luck. My father. He'd be working around the house or at his job and he would just trip and fall for no reason. It happened three or four times. Long story short, it was ALS and he died from it just over three years after those initial symptoms. My dad had a sore throat and kept losing his voice. The docs couldn't figure it out. Finally, they figured out it was ALS. He died in about a year. The falling came later on. It's a sad, sad disease. A few years ago on vacation, I overheard the table next to me talking about how their mum's voice had been gone for months and they couldn't figure it out. My heart sank. After their lunch, I pulled one of them aside and told them to ask their doc about the possibility of ALS. I told them I hoped that it wasn't, but it might be good to ask. He had no idea what ALS was, and I hope he didn't Google it. That small pain that never seemed to completely go away just under the left side of my ribcage could have saved myself the horrible experience of acute pancreatitis. Iron deficiency that doesn't get better no matter how much supplementation you take. I have Crohn's disease. Same, except celiac disease. I was so tired of doctors taking blood to check my iron that I started refusing. I told them, yes, I'm anemic, I always have been. I've been on iron and iron builders for years, so no more blood work unless you tell me you're checking for something else. I need my blood more than you do. I should have made more of an effort to get them to look for why. A week before my fourth Halloween, I was playing on my cat-in-the-hat scooter and fell on the pavement and got a good scratch on my knee. 24 hours later, it started itching pretty bad. Another 24 hours later, I couldn't sleep. It was itching like crazy and getting red and hot to the touch. Mum thinks I'm being a drama queen. In her defense, I was a bit of a dramatic three-nager and doesn't really look at it too closely. 24 hours later, it aches so bad I can't walk and the itching and redness is worse. I end up in the hospital for a week with cellulitis that's so bad I came very close to amputation and death. I had no clue at the time, but my mum said it was bad enough that they told her to have relatives come to visit, just in case it was their last chance to do so. The doctor told my mum that if I'd come into the office on the first or second day, I might have gotten by with just a strong injection of penicillin and a week of oral antibiotics. What are some scams everybody should be made aware of? If they say it's not a pyramid scheme, it is. If you have to pay to work there, you're a customer, not an employee. HonorSociety.org. I got an email from them and it seemed legit since they had my name and school, but they want $50 to join, and according to them, I was being invited because academic achievements. Bullcrap! I did real bad that semester. Funny thing is, I didn't know it existed until I got an email from them today, and after which, I proceeded to Google them and then write the story. Credit card scam. You get a call from someone claiming to be your credit card company. They say someone's been using your card. They have all your info and they tell you what it is. They have your name, address, credit card number, and maybe even the last four of your social security number. What they don't have is the three-digit code on the back of your credit card, and that's what they're after. They ask you to verify it to check your identity. They'll say it's to check that you're still in possession of your credit card. You give it to them, and that's what they need to run up your credit card online. For everyone asking why they have your other data and not the three-digit number, it's because businesses aren't allowed to store or keep it like your other info. Has anyone ever noticed that an online store might have your credit card number on file, but they still ask you for the CVV? That's why.
We can't pay much right now, but if this project goes well, there will be lots more work down the road. I've been in the freelance-ish design business for 14 years and never has more work down the road panned out when the client uses it as a hook to get an upfront discount. Stick to clients who can pay. Imagine if you went into a subway and instead of offering you a tenth sandwich free after paying for nine, you said, how about I pay you half price for the first sandwich and then if I like it, I'll probably buy more sandwiches at full price down the road. A friend of mine just told me his daughter met someone at work and scored a 140k job a year as some project manager. She's currently a part-time cashier. Turns out it's a new social media startup and she won't get paid until after her first year of work. I tried to give some caution without sounding too cynical, but they were so damn excited. The main exception to this being a scam might be performance and acting type work, but even then, you need to be so careful and scope out the person you're working with, their credentials, and who else is on board. The narrator has been with both successful and failed projects before in his line of work. Basically, there's no such thing as too much information. The fake kidnapping and ransom scam that preys on the elderly. Someone called my in-laws-to-be early in the morning one day, saying they'd kidnapped their son and his wife, we weren't even married at the time, in Mexico, and we wouldn't be released unless they wired over a crazy amount of money. They heard screaming in the background and a man shouting, Dad, help me, help me! They looked on our Facebook page and saw that they'd checked us in at a Latin restaurant in Thailand where they knew we were, but thought, huh, maybe they went to Mexico. So his parents flipped out and were about to pay before his eldest brother called me in the middle of our Thailand night to prove to them that we were alive. People should ask for answers to personal questions, attempt to contact the supposedly kidnapped, and other steps before falling for these pricks BS. Usually when someone who contacts your house claiming to be someone from the government agency or Microsoft, it's just a lead up to a scam. Just always ask for some kind of identification and sometimes googling the phone number can lead you somewhere. I had a guy with a thick Indian accent call and say he was from Microsoft tech support and he had an alert that claimed I had terrible viruses on my computer. I asked him who he worked for and he said, Windows tech support. He wanted me to go on some website to download a program that would remotely connect him to my computer. The kicker is, the website he sent me to had a warning page that said, There are scammers using this website to get your info. They're claiming to be from Windows or Microsoft. Your bank will never send people to your house to take your cards from you. I was visiting my grandma's house when she got scammed. Got a call about 9pm from someone claiming to be the police. Yes, your grandson was in a car accident while driving drunk. He's here at the police station, and this is his phone call. I'll put him on. Her grandson gets on the phone. Grandma? Sorry, my voice sounds funny. I broke my nose in the wreck. I'm in jail. Can you pay my bail? Grandma was hysterical. She didn't have the money to pay the bail they were asking for, and she was calling relatives left and right trying to pull some money together to get him out. In a last-ditch effort, she called her grandson's cell phone, and he picked up, perfectly fine, wondering why she was calling so late. Needless to say, we called the police, but they couldn't trace the number. Disgusting how they took advantage of an old lady like that. I thought she'd have a heart attack. In short, don't pay anyone's bail unless you know they're in jail. There's a pyramid scheme that's been going around my area the last year or so. It's called World Ventures. Basically disguises itself as a discount travel club. It's legal since they sell a tangible product, but the business itself is extremely shady and gets sued all the time. They usually prey on college students, stay-at-home mums, and returning veterans. Ugh. I work for a BMW dealership and have sold cars to these people. I've tried telling them it's a scam, but they won't listen. It pains me to know that they'll have to give up their cars in a few months when they no longer have people who will buy their discount travel packages. If you ever get stopped by a deaf person trying to sell you a pin for three bucks, 99% of the time, they're not deaf. One time I was in a Starbucks and a deaf guy walked around once passing out leaflets on how to sign basic letters and then walked around again asking for money by tapping on you and putting out his hand. When he got to the girl right before me, she started to sign to him fluently, and he just gave her a thumbs up and walked out. My sister used to hang out with a lot of deaf people. I don't think she officially got her interpreter's license, but she was close. She got in the habit of carrying business cards with information about this group that helps getting jobs, plays in bowling leagues together, just generic, hey, we're deaf, come hang out with us, kind of group. Whenever she started signing and gave them a card, they quickly left. There was only one time where a girl took the card and started hanging out with them. I guess, like with everything, there are times where the scam isn't a scam, but the scammers ruin it for the few good people who are there. 
I work in a bank. Some scammers will test whether your card works by making a £5 donation to a charity, which can be done on ATMs. If this works, they'll slowly start to empty your account by buying vouchers from supermarkets. If you see a charitable donation you didn't make, investigate it immediately. Door-to-door -door magazine sales While some of these are legitimate, I got scammed out of 40 to 50 bucks about 7 years ago. A kid came up to my door. I saw there was a white van down the end of the street and about 10 to 15 kids getting out of it. This one particular kid stopped at my door, gave me a pitch about how they were selling magazines to build a fund that would send them all to college, and I thought to myself, why not help this kid out? The kid was about 16 or 17 and had an ID badge that said he worked for some charity or something, and he could offer me budget subscriptions. More than half off the price if I were to subscribe through the actual magazine's website. I signed up for Maxim, Muscle Mustangs, and Fast Forwards, and two or three others. Never received those magazines. Talked to my neighbor down the street that signed up for one of them, and he never received this either. Watch your grannies. One with dementia here almost got taken for thousands from scammers in Jamaica. She was on her way to the mailbox, but looked so sneaky the nursing home staff alerted her daughter, who put stop checks on everything, including checks that Granny had mailed the day before. A U-Haul reservation isn't reserving an actual vehicle for you, it's just putting you in their system as someone who wants a vehicle. And their reservation guarantee is a scam, since there's always a truck two states over you could use, but of course you'd have to pay for the extra mileage. Working in banking, I see this kind of crap a lot. If someone sends you a check that is more than it should be and you have to send a portion back to them, stop! This is a scam. No legitimate business or individual does business this way. That check will bounce and you will be caught holding the bag. Somebody got a hold of our company name and account numbers to pull this scam on people. I had to field so many calls telling people not to do it. I had one lady accuse me of trying to scam her after I finally got annoyed and said, I want you to explain to me exactly how I plan to scam you by asking you not to send money to a stranger. Most of us are delighted by the dream that the difficulty in our little lives might be alleviated by some sudden influx of money, and do away with little things like common sense. Don't be too hard on people, guys. If you're a male westerner and you travel to Eastern Europe, a super common scam is that two very attractive girls introduce themselves and hang out with you for the day. It's a long con. They have some story about why they want someone to hang with, they'll have a meal with you, go to some tourist attractions, seriously spending a day. One of them will seem to have a personal interest in you. Then they suggest a place for drinks or food. The girls order for you, everything is fine. Then the bill comes and it's something insane like $1,500. If you can't pay it, bouncers appear and walk you to the nearest bank to help you withdraw as much as you can. It's become a common enough scam that just about every guidebook and hostel check-in will warn you. To clarify, yes, the restaurant or club is in on it. Yes, the girls are working with the club. Yes, the bouncers are working with the girls and the club. Yes, it's a scam and not a coincidence. The girls did not rack up a $1,500 bill to get the guys to pay for it. The girls collude with the bar to get the guys to agree to order a single $1,500 drink. The girls get paid a cut. Another common and shorter scheme that targets foreigners worldwide is the broken package scam. Essentially, they find some nice-looking but cheap and fragile art. Then they'll walk around with it in a bag looking for a timid-looking tourist, exchange student, or whatever. They'll then set it to bump into them, dropping the package, and then flying into a rage about how the tourist broke their $300 to $1,500 vase or whatever. Hi, do you have the time? Take out your phone and check. And mugged. I was at a baseball game for a work outing. I just got the Galaxy S3. I was in a secluded seating area by a hot dog stand, playing around on it instead of watching the game. This 11 to 13 year old comes up and asks to borrow it. He had been separated from his parents. Nope, but I'll help you find a park employee to get you a phone. The second I found an employee, the kid went running. And my friends tease me for still wearing a watch. Who's laughing now? You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. The kids that come to your door selling magazine subscriptions are not trying to get money for college. Most of the time, those subscriptions are bullcrap, the kid is being taken advantage of by some butthole, and it's near slavery conditions. Don't support these buttholes. Do not cash someone's check for them at the ATM, no matter how distressed they seem. It will just bounce. The Florida government pulls out public service announcements that says this, paraphrased, 
If you want anyone to leave your house, even employees of a business, tell them. If they won't, call the cops and the cops will come out and make them leave. In other words, don't let anyone intimidate you, even if they're for real. I've heard of this one but haven't seen it. You're driving, say in the right lane, and a crappy-looking car gets in front of you while another crappy-looking car sits in your blind spot to your left side. The car in front slows down little by little until you're annoyed and possibly tailgating them, setting the trap. He then slams on the brakes and stops short, giving you either the choice of rear-ending him or swerving into his buddy. Either way, you hit a junker of a car and he asks for cash to not report it to the insurance. Ways to avoid? Don't tailgate. Pretty simple. Follow at a safe distance. If you do rear-end or swerve into the car, just report it to the insurance. A lot of the times, these people don't have insurance, and if they do, they might not see any of the money and their rates will go up either way. You'll still have to pay and your rates will go up, but at least the scammer didn't get off for free. They sell the hair they get for tens of millions, then only donate a few hundred wigs a year. If you have to buy anything other than a basic set of power tools before you can start your new job, it's a scam. I'm looking at you, Pyramid Schemes. ACN is a huge scam. 500 bucks to join, only move up by getting people to join. You make all your money by bringing in suckers. You make next to nothing from selling their services. They prey on college kids that need quick money. Typical Pyramid Scheme. The big shots in the company pump all their money into nice cars to sell the illusion of money. A lot of them also drive obviously rented BMWs and Mercedes. They are scum. My mother never met a pyramid scam she didn't love. She tried to get me to sign up for this ACN garbage. She invited me and my brother over for dinner one night and wanted to introduce us to their new friends. We didn't even get more than 10 minutes into our visit and their friends wanted to sit us down and talk to us about a business venture we might be interested in. I stopped the guy about two minutes into his sales pitch and was like, Are you kidding me? You brought us over here to try and sell us on a pyramid scheme? I left. It actually did some harm to my relationship with my parents for a couple of months. When you go to other countries on vacation and you get on a tour, there are definitely places, especially in China, where you're intended to stop and have a look around. But at many of those places, they won't let you leave until you buy something. This is how these guys make money. Man, you could make an entire thread on China scams. I've been to China three times and dodging the scams was a ton of fun. If you won the Canadian lottery and you've never been to Canada or played the Canadian lottery, it's not real. I've had a couple of people come into the banks I've worked in thinking they won all this money and then get teed off when you give them the reality check that it's not real. And by reality check, do you mean telling them the situation or handing them a check from the register with the words, you got scammed, sorry, eh, written on it? You work in a bank, so either option is viable. If you're at uni, keep an eye out for VEMA, pyramid scheme that doesn't say it, aimed at students. The American one is Vector Marketing. They advertise for students to start at $15 an hour, so naturally a lot of kids are interested. It's door-to-door -door knife sales and the $15 an hour is if your commission is at a certain level. They're calculating that number by taking your commission and dividing it by the number of hours you've worked. There's actually zero base pay. They claim that the knives sell themselves. Okay, my roommate in college sat through a two-hour seminar from these guys. Vema is in America now, and it's the biggest freaking scam I've ever seen. They're lying to college kids, brainwashing them into thinking that they can actually make money by selling this energy drink, Verve, to other people, so those people can try to sell it. They pitch it as starting your own business and tell them that if they end up moving X amount of product, we'll pay for you to finance your car, in which they give you $400 a month to use on whatever you want, but they pretty much plant the idea in your head that you need to get a Range Rover, Audi, BMW, etc., and have Vema stickers covering it. But when the person you're flipping a product to's business goes under because someone you were selling to can't afford it anymore, or any situation in which your network isn't meeting the quota to be eligible for the monthly stipend, they stop giving you that $400 a month that they've convinced you to use on a high-end car, and you're still responsible for the payments, with no income. I could go on for days, but basically this is a huge problem on college campuses and it doesn't get nearly enough attention. I've said it before and I'll say it again, lifelock. Complete croc of doo-doo. The owner likes to publish his social security number as a marketing gimmick as proof that his service works. It works so well that he's had his identity stolen 13 times. Check your credit card once a year for free. All major bureaus are required by law to offer this at a number of credit card checking websites. Report any discrepancies to the bureaus directly. Do not go to any of the credit report websites that require you to sign up for stuff. That is another complete scam. 
Don't buy stereo systems from guys in vans. Don't buy anything from guys in vans, unless it's your substance dealer. Not even ice cream? This will ruin my summer. The Polish or hot dog with a 20-ounce drink and one free refill at Costco Food Court for $1.50. Costco is getting scammed on this deal. I bought my first house last year, and I had at least one scam per week coming in the mail for the first couple of months. All of them look very official, and as a first-time home buyer, they kind of freaked me out. Luckily, Google Foo is strong, and I was able to do proper research to prevent me from being screwed. Former retail jewelry clerk here, jewelry has to be one of the biggest rip-offs by far. Jewelry is relatively cheap to make, especially things made with silver. At a store I used to work at, we were selling CZ and sterling silver rings that were purchased for 8 bucks and were marked up to 160 bucks, but it was always on sale for 60% off. Then there's those diamond rings that literally have a diamond chip surrounded by a strategically cut piece of silver that gives it the illusion it's a bigger diamond. On sale for only 200 bucks. Then there's that white gold bullcrap. There's no such thing as white gold, it's just normal gold covered in rhodium that you have to get replaced every so often. If you like the look of white gold and don't have special allergies, just get silver and save yourself some money. Gold is probably marked up for at least 500% of the amount of what gold and diamonds are actually worth. Probably not as common, but I work in a pharmacy, so here's my two cents. Brand name doesn't mean better. There are basically only three medications of one class where it matters a bit more that you get brand over generic. They're Synthroid, Calmodin, and the epilepsy medication. It's not even that that brand is better, it's just that since those drugs have a very narrow therapeutic range of effect, we want to make sure you stay stable and generics can vary slightly in potency. Since there's some confusion, there is no issue if you take generics of one of the ones listed here. They're just as effective, just that you don't want to switch back and forth from generic to brand. For any other medication, your body doesn't care if you take generic. There are exceptions if you're allergic to an inactive ingredient, but generally everyone is fine on a generic. There are always exceptions to the rule, of course, but the general rule of thumb is that you're going to be fine on a generic medication. Epileptic here, people always ask me why I don't take generic when I say my pills are expensive. This is why. I would rather pay than have a seizure. The biggest scam most of us will fall for is buying our college textbooks from your university store. Anytime anyone tries to sell you something unsolicited, whether it's in person, by mail or digitally, just say no. There's no magic deal fairy that's looking out for your best needs that's going to fall from the sky and conveniently present you with something you want or need. The Who's Who books I still cringe when I think about my mum falling for this one. They send you an offer to put you in a book as being someone that's worth something. You have to fill out the form they send you, and then send it back to them with 50 bucks. And then, in about a month, they send you a behemoth-sized book, which is basically just a list of people who've paid to be in said book. My mum has published a few books, so when she first got the offer to be in the Who's Who book, she thought it was a legitimate bit of recognition. We realized it was scammy a few months later when I got the same offer for having received my Bachelor of Arts. Your daughter was not referred to us as someone who might enjoy acting or modeling opportunities. We buy mailing lists. Of course, you'll come out anyway to one of the open call sessions to see what we're all about. We'll tell you we'll call you if your little girl is accepted to compete as a finalist. 100% guarantee she will be. Don't believe the bullcrap about processing applications. Then we just need you to pay us a sponsor fee so she can compete. Of course, if anything comes up and you have to take your daughter out of our pageant, you're screwed because sponsor fees are non-refundable in the fine print. But it's totally worth the steep fee to compete because your daughter is really beautiful. And we're not just saying that, and you could win part of $20,000 and... Okay, maybe I'm a little bit bitter. I guess it isn't technically a scam, but if people were less apt to get blinded by the dollar signs, my company would very likely be out of business, and I don't think I'd be very sad about that. When you're jobless and looking on Craigslist, I know, big red flag right there, but hey, you never know, always grab post information during the phone call about location and job description and Google the crap out of them. I've been potentially scammed quite a few times. What's the most disturbing thing you've found when working on someone else's computer? MS Paint <sighs> being used to design the company logo. A buddy wanted me to convert a hard drive to an external. Needed some copying and formatting, he had tons of pictures of Arctic sea life. It was like every walrus, seal, or aquatic life form on Google image search was saved to his hard drive. I'm pretty sure he did it to mess with me. Was it originally his C drive? 
It was probably made by Seagate. I work as an accountant now, but in a former life I did a stint in tech support. I remember getting a report that a printer, a LaserJet 5P, was constantly jamming. I arrived and started checking all the usual spots for paper fragments to get stuck in rollers. I flipped down the back cover and a chunk of fried chicken fell out. I still have no idea. I had a customer who wanted me to find pictures of her son's eggplant on the computer. The long version of the story is, the son had gotten in legal trouble in the past for sending unsolicited pictures of his twigginberries to anyone and everyone. He wasn't allowed to use the internet on the computer, but as his parents were computer illiterate, they had no idea whether or not he was doing it again, and they wanted to find out. I ended up writing her instructions and showing her how to search for herself, as searching for pictures of her underage son's wang was in ethically murky waters. It was a good thing I did too, because she ended up finding some. I really wonder the legal grounds for that. I'm fairly certain it would not be illegal. The actual illegal act of child prawn is when you're sharing it or consuming it. It's not when you stumble upon it. So I think you would have been fine. Very strange story though. Half an inch of fluffy, sticky white gunk coating every inch of the interior. It was a podiatrist's office. It was next to a sort of booth where they would grind the calluses off old people's feet. I didn't know that when I opened it up, I just knew that it smelled faintly of burnt hair. This is uniquely gross and I have no words other than the ones currently coming out of my mouth. What can I say? It deserved acknowledgement. Also, there are a few stories where we'll be using the word prawn as a placeholder for its similar sounding word meaning adult content used for the gratification of those with time on their hands. Case in point. I was setting up my grandfather's printer and he warned me, there's a lot of prawns on there, meaning on the PC. I laughed and showed him how to delete his search history. I had a girl ask to use my computer and I was like, hell no, there's so much prawns on this thing. And she goes, ah, I don't care. Mother fricky, you just don't do that to people. You don't care if I watch prawns, but you will care if you see all the kinds of prawns that I watch. We ain't talking playboy here. My dad has his own software company and does tech support for it and general computer repairs for anyone who drops by his office. Don't know what's the most disturbing thing he's come across, but I was present when a man dropped his mother's laptop. Dad booted it up and immediately encountered a common problem. It was password protected. So he asks the son for the password. The son has to call his mum to get it. The mum tells the son who has to relay it to my dad. Suck Big Wang 2014 Read a story on here about a geek squad type guy who found a bunch of gory murder scene photos. Turned out the guy was a homicide detective though. Call it professional courtesy, but I feel like that's probably something you should give a heads up about. I don't do the job anymore, but once I did an install where they ordered adult channel for their service. No big deal, but as soon as I get there he starts, you have the channel on there, right? And I look at the order and say, yeah. So I'm doing the install and his wife offers me a drink and food. I turn it down, we're supposed to, it's job policy. I also did a virus check on their computer. So after I finish the install for the cable, he says, Okay, now show us the channel. Usually people wait for us to leave, so it was weird to look up the channel and watch prawns in a guy's house with his wife on a 65-inch TV. So I excuse myself to work on the computer. As soon as I log in, the last page he was on was importing foreign women for doing the deed, like mail-order brides. The next tab was for Group Whoopi, and the next tab was for Craigslist. I didn't go too far into it because it was just really awkward as I heard the sounds from the TV downstairs. So when I go to leave, him and his wife don't look at me and they are fixated on the teeming prawns on the television. I say my goodbye speech, but they don't even turn. It was just weird all round for me. Pictures of graveyards at night and a guy with a hood and torch walking in them and digging. Plans detailing a prospective campus rampage on the same computer as very sweet emails to his grandmother. He had self-deleted two months prior and I was recovering data for his family. I didn't tell them. The guy was severely overweight. I found before and after shaving pictures of his crotch and butthole. I couldn't even look him in the eye when I handed his computer back to him. I did computer work for eight years. Conservatively, I serviced around a thousand machines a year. I never went digging through the computer or anything, but I stumbled upon CP three times. Do some thinking to figure out what CP could stand for on a person's computer and why we'd arrest someone for it. We had a contact at the local FBI and there was a quarantine procedure to preserve chain of custody and all of that. 
However, if you really want to gross people out in the office, mention Mr. Santa. This guy had a super slow PC, which was one of the reasons he brought it in. From power on to being able to open the start menu was 45 minutes. The only problem is, his desktop was a full screen image of himself wearing a Santa hat and only a Santa hat. He was rather large and had hundreds of warts everywhere. God damn. Guy was having problems with his computer, so he brought it to us for a virus removal. Standard stuff, I set it up with a monitor, keyboard, and left it to boot up. When I came back, it had booted to desktop. The background was a picture of a guy, not the customer, fully undressed and spread eagle. I've never switched a monitor so fast. I'm working Geek Squad years ago. This guy comes in, tatted up head to toe, not your punk band tattoos, fully blown multi years in prison tattoos. Plops down his tower. I heard you do data backup. How much to back up all of my prawns? I see labor dollars, and without missing a beat, I seize his crustacean folder and quote him 160 bucks to put it into two DVD discs. The manager rips me a new one, not sure why, labor dollars are huge, and go to his bonus, and says I have to do the work. Whatever. I just copied the files over. I didn't even see anything. It's just file names whizzing by. Well, one caught my eye. Piegrape.avi. Pi as in P-I. Grape? Crap. What is this, I think? Some sort of math prawn? Sure enough, I fire it up. I have to see what it is. A woman comes out in a nightgown and takes it off, rubs something between her legs, lays down and spreads them. Before you know it, a full-blown pig rolls into the scene, jumps on the bed, and the rest is history. Then I realize in the split second what the file name was on my screen. I misread it and can never unsee it. And thank god you misread it, because frankly, I'm still not sure it's okay to put this one in one of our videos. Oh well, YOLO! My grandmother passed away recently, and my 87-year-old grandfather got a new girlfriend, 27 years younger than him, about two months after she died. I was setting up a printer for his laptop, and in his bookmarks he had a few links to marital aid distributors. So now I know that my grandfather does the deed far more often than I do, and needs medication to get it up. Which makes sense, I suppose. All people be doing it all the time. Sure, but I would rather be willfully ignorant of my grandfather's bedroom life. Sort of like how some parents prefer to pretend that their children have never ever done the deed and never want to. Found a folder on my mum's computer titled Sins of My Children, found weird poetry and if I recall correctly, chat logs of some guy offering to kill my wife and me. Holy crap man, you can't just post that and not elaborate. Are relations okay with your mother now? My mother has always hated my wife. We were trying to get through it by going to a museum together. My mum said a friend of hers was going to meet up with us there, but he never showed up. Then later, I found the folder when I was fixing her computer. I barely talk to her now. My cousin worked for a summer doing IT stuff for her mum's company. She worked on a co-worker's laptop and discovered explicit emails indicating he was sleeping with her mum, who was still married to her dad. I was asked to double-check a bunch of computers for pictures and identifying information before recycling the towers. Found a Windows 98 machine that hadn't seen the internet in a very long time. And on it was Napster. Just like we choose to remember it. Along with ICQ, Yahoo Messenger, and CompuServe. I found a load of prawns while working on a client's computer. Lots of browsers, cuts, and fragments of videos. I came to find out he wasn't obsessed with shellfish at all, he was an editor for Brazzers. A photo album full of polar bears with coke bottles photoshopped onto their hands, like very badly done. About 40 photos and I was just trying to update a friend's drivers and couldn't resist opening the folder called Coke Bears. A relative once asked me to help find some files on her very cluttered hard disk. When a search failed me, I started browsing through folders when I found it. Pictures of pillows. Every single kind of pillow possible, with lots of different colors and decorations. There were literally thousands of pictures, including some with what looked like bloodstains on them. I worked at a law firm, started getting calls in the morning that some random attorneys could not log in. When we checked out their computer, it turns out that they were ignoring their username, which was defaulted to the last user logged in. It turned out someone was logging in as user library. Checked out the law library and sure enough, a sticky note with the library username and password existed just above the monitor. This routine persisted for a few more weeks as I tried to figure out how to catch the culprit. Sure, I could disable the account, but then we'd never find out who's ducking into random offices surfing prawns. That was in the cache of the library user account name on the local machine. We used a startup script called Kickstart. 
highly configurable to do whatever you need it to do. So I added to the startup script to email the administration group whenever the library user logs in. First night, I get the email. Late at night, I call security and ask them to check our floor. Nothing too unusual. We ask them to check floors occasionally due to stuck open doors from positive airflow, etc. They replied back, all clear. Huh, weird. Okay. Second night, same story, nothing unusual reported back from security. However, the next morning I came in to a request from an attorney to help him log in. Same computer from the night before, default user, you guessed it, library. This attorney had poor eyesight. As I'm clicking away, checking out the browsing history our mystery library user left behind, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. A couple of dabs of Elmer's glue. It's early, pre-coffee. What's an attorney doing with glue? Then I realize what I'm staring at. Not glue. I threw up in my mouth a little. Fast forward a week and it happens again. Email notification late at night, security called, also notice another attorney logged in a few offices down. I called him immediately and asked him to check the office where we just saw the library logged in. He checks and reports back a few minutes later. Nothing unusual, just a security guard. I just called security no less than two minutes before. No way they could get to the top floor in time to check up on our request. It was the security guard yanking on his brake. I notified the building manager the following morning. They pulled him in, questioned him, and he admitted his guilt. He was dismissed immediately. In short, public log on on a post-it note in the office. Someone used it to surf shellfish material and splooged on a desk at night. Turns out it was the security guard. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. I placed my hand on the user's mouse and my hand stuck to it due to lubricant on the mouse. Computer itself could hardly function due to prawn pop-ups. My friend's mum. Seven antivirus programs installed. Internet Explorer has six inch tall of toolbars. I have to note that me and her son both have masters in computer engineering. He always tried to educate her, but she would just get mad. He gave up. The fact that she is still using Internet Explorer means that she was just a lost cause, sadly. 52 gigabytes of prawns, 1 terabyte of gore. I never touched that computer again. 1 terabyte of Al Gore? I had no idea there was that much. I had a co-worker that wanted me to come by his house to fix his PC. This was like 15 years ago. He takes me up to his bedroom, not too unusual, he was having internet connection issues. I was so focused on checking cabling to his modem, router and other things under the desk that it took me a while to also notice next to the desk the camera on a tripod, pointed at the bed. It all clicked when I finally got the interwebs working again, launched his browser, and his homepage was some couples sharing a special interest website. My grandma was having problems. I looked at her history and there was a crap ton of gang clanging prawns. Hey, she's old, not dead. I work in a senior day center, but I used to do software development, so every now and then one of the other staff will ask me to fix whatever computer problems they're having. One time, one of the nursing assistants asked me to look at her laptop and had brought it in. I told her I'd look at it during my lunch break, different time from hers, and she said, fine. So I opened up the thing in the break room only to be confronted with a bunch of windows with very exposed pictures of her and her boyfriend, the topmost picture being his BBC. Fortunately, the only person in the room was across the table and couldn't see anything, but I noped the heck out of there. I gave her a bit of crap for potentially getting me fired, but it was kind of fun to have her squirm knowing what I'd seen. I lent a friend the use of my laptop for a three-hour game of D&D. &D. He used a site called Fur Affinity to download lots of Third Reich dog prawns. Drawings of Dobermen in those uniforms doing the deed with each other. When I confronted him, he said, You'd think there'd be more German shepherds. Not me, but a friend borrowed his lieutenant's computer while we were deployed in Iraq. Found a lot of inappropriate material featuring miners in it. Pictures of him teabagging other soldiers while they were sleeping, you know, the usual. Yep, yeah, he's a level 2 unspeakable act offender now. A video of three guys helping a goat commit the unspeakable act on a person. They walked the guy out the door 15 minutes later. A customer bought in his old HP tower and it absolutely reeked. A smell I can't even describe accurately, but it would be something along the lines of decaying ball bag cheese built up after a week of not showering and high intensity training. Anyhow, we don't work on it yet that day, but end up having to wrap it in garbage bags and duct tape every opening to stop it from stinking up the tech shop.
The next day we came in and the bag was slightly open. The entire store stinks of this now, and we had to open all the doors and set up fans for airflow the entire day. We unwrap the PC and connect it to power, after which a green-orange flume of debris comes out of the power supply fan, making a smell that has the original stench seeming tolerable. As one brave tech gets close to press the CD drive button, as soon as he touches it you hear rustling and as soon as the drive tray opens, it was literally like you see in horror movies. A river of cockroaches pouring out of the open mouth of this PC. We yanked the power cords and ran it outside as well as spending the next four months trying different kinds of extermination to get rid of the infestation in our store. It was so bad an event that the entire store full of introverted and non-confrontational techies managed enough bravery to call the guy up and actually tell him how unacceptable it was and that he needs to get his crap and leave. The guy responded, oh, it's not that bad really, but didn't give up much of a fight other than that. I can't even begin to imagine how awful of conditions this guy must have lived in to have a PC this bad. I don't even know how the thing functioned. This was even worse than the guys we caught with underage prawns, which we were required to report to authorities for you sickos that think that's okay. Similar story, we had a guy bring a PS4 that wasn't working into my store. We had pretty much accepted that we couldn't repair it, but he wanted his game out of it. We broke it open and found a nest of roaches. Quadruple bagged that crap and told him he needed to take it away. I worked at a repair shop as well. I don't know what it is with PS4s, but something about them attracts cockroaches. I've seen multiple PS4s with cockroaches and no Xboxes. No computers either, just PS4s. While I was in high school, I also worked for the school district as a student computer tech. My English teacher said her friend's computer was acting up and they wanted some help. After some general tinkering with settings, dumping caches, defragging disks, and uninstalling some bloatware, I determined they could use a clean install of their operating system. So I started to copy all their files to an external drive and was prepping a new partition to install the OS on. Well, you know those neat previews of the files you're transferring? I started seeing nothing but weird 80s clown prawn. Yeah, did I mention I was doing this at my school too? Ended up just locking the computer in a closet for the remainder of the file transfers and configured the computer with all their files and pretended I didn't see a thing when I gave it back. A neighbor asked to have their son's computer looked at because it kept blue screening. I agreed and braced myself for a bunch of prawns. The kid was 14. Nothing. A crap load of video games, but not a crustacean to be seen. What kind of 14-year-old boy who owns his own PC doesn't have prawns? The kind of 14-year-old that knows it's possible to stream his various shrimps and lobsters and not have them saved permanently to your computer for people like you to find. Seriously, I mean who the frick downloads and saves their aquatic invertebrae these days? Honestly, at the age of 14, I didn't have this kind of sea-dwelling fauna anywhere on my personal PC. That's a later teenage thing in my head. A friend of my dad asked me if I could take a look at their family computer because Windows kept complaining about running out of disk space while there was nothing on there. I took a quick peek and indeed, not much going on. Barely any programs installed, no games on the C drive. There were some games installed on Steam through their 16-year-old son, but he was smart enough to place them on a second drive. Videos folder completely empty, picture folder empty, documents looked fairly clean. So I download Windostat, and to my surprise it finds nearly 175 gigs of data in the documents folder. At this point I already knew what was going on here and I told the dad who was standing beside me that it would take a while, so he offered to go and pick up some food for us, three. His son was home too, and left. There was a folder for save files from GTA 3, with 175 gigabyte of images hidden in it. 175 gigs of exotic prawn, Nicely organized in multiple subfolders by name, type, etc. I moved the folder in its entirety to the other partition under some random name and had a little chat with their son. He was so embarrassed but promised me he would keep them somewhere safe from now on. I just told the dad that there were tons of log files being generated by some app that didn't work right and kept it at that. I used to work at the Apple store and one of my co-workers was running a diagnostic on an iMac and found 100 gigs worth of illegal material featuring miners. The store contacted the police and a sting operation was set up. He was arrested at the store and later convicted. The co-worker needed to take some time off though as he had two little kids and was pretty traumatized by what he saw. Freshman year of college, a few of us were hanging out in one of our dorm rooms and we got on the subject of music. The guy who lived there mentioned that his roommate listened to some really weird techno kind of music, but it was actually pretty cool. So he got on the computer to try and find it. They were friends and they got along well so he knew the password. Anyway, he got his external and it turns out the guy has tons of music saved. Eventually we see a folder called something in German, so we decided to check it out, thinking it might be the techno music. 
What we found were about 20 to 30 pictures of the same undressed guy. Some of them were with women and some of them were just him by himself. But the shocking thing about it was that his eggplant was at least 10 inches and it was curved a complete 90 degrees to one side. Not like a tight right angle, but it tapered around and the tip bent to face completely to the side. We confronted him about it and apparently he had a bunch of prawns saved on there and he had just stumbled on this dude somewhere and thought it was weird, so he saved a bunch of pictures of him. In short, college dorm mate had a thing for huge bent wangs. We found his stash and called him Curvature Joe for the rest of our time at uni. He had a folder on his computer entitled Barely Regal devoted to racy photos of Sarah Ferguson, former Duchess of York. Was helping my mom with something on her phone once, did the thing to open all the apps running in the background so I could close them. Saw an undressed picture of her that she probably sent to her boyfriend. And I'm ruined. I recycle work computers frequently for the next employee that they get assigned to. So many prawns. According to my grandfather's search history, he likes fat old B-words. Truth be told, I was just glad that his searches were age-appropriate. What's the most unprofessional thing a doctor has said to you? It wasn't so much something he said as something he did. I came in for a suspected broken leg and he had a couple of residents with him. After the x-ray and having already found out my leg was indeed broken, he grabs my leg and looks to the residents and says, An old but reliable method for diagnosing a broken leg is to place a hand on the ankle, a hand on the knee, and place your knee in the center, then pretend like you're trying to break a stick. If they yell, their leg is broken. He actually fricking did it to me three times to teach these residents. I haven't been back to him since. Bro, I would have punched him if he'd tried that crap. I'm not a violent person, but he's literally talking about pushing a broken bone with his knee. That's bullcrap. Dude, that's only part of it. The whole reason I had to go to him, family doctor, is because the hospital screwed my stuff up. The day I broke it, I went to the hospital and had it x-rayed. They said I'd just bruised the bone but didn't break it. They sent me home with some meds and that was that. Well, one month later, it was still hurting just as bad. So I went to the doctor from my original comment. Like I said, he diagnosed my broken leg. I'd been walking around on said broke leg without a cast for one month. It even grew back crooked. I even paid the hospital 500 bucks for their x-ray. I guess the moral of the story is that if you're a 240 pound man, don't play on rope swings. Well, F me sideways. I got an x-ray of my back and hips. The doctor's first time seeing them was with me in the room. These words, folks, is how I found out that my back was broke. To explain, one of my legs is shorter than the other, so my hips don't align. Anything involving moving my hips since I was a kid has basically made the base of my spine grind against itself. By the time we figured this out, my L4 and L5 disc had nearly degenerated to nothing, and my sciatic nerve was basically sitting there waving at everyone without any protection in that area. Yeah, I had something very similar when I broke bones in my elbow. The radiologist asked if I could straighten it out. I told him I couldn't, so he snapped a couple of x-rays. With a look of horror, he exclaimed, Holy frick! No wonder you can't move it. Just keep it still till we can get the orthopedic surgeon on call. I had a leading allergy specialist say to me, Well, I'll be effed if I know. After a lengthy investigation over several weeks into my post-nasal drip issues, he'd tried everything and was all out of ideas. I didn't mind at all, in fact, I rather appreciated his honesty. It's probably quite telling that a lot of these in a row are just doctors using the F word to underline the fact they haven't been able to diagnose. And yeah, I'm fine with the language to state the irritating nature of the problem. Another commenter agrees. Similar thing happened with my father-in-law. Men in that family have huge heads and thick necks. Not fat, just structurally over-engineered. He was having neck pain and went in to get a surgery consult after seeing other doctors. The doctor comes in for the consult, takes one look and says, If my head was that big, my neck would hurt too. My father-in-law fell over laughing and they had a great working relationship from there on out working through the recovery. The doctor was doing a pap smear and he said, Whoa, at one point while the speculum was in. I never did find out why, but I'm assuming he was just amazed by my awesome lady parts. I need you to be fully firm, referring to my wang. I was referred to a urologist for Peyronie's disease. I believe my Johnson had been developing a bend in it. As part of his assessment, the urologist gave me an injection in the named part and some adult magazines. He left me alone in the room so I could become excited. Then he returned and used a toy to make me fully firm. However, when I told him I was on the verge of arriving, he just kept going and I splooched. Then he took some measurements with plastic rulers. 
He said that he needed to do this to take reference measurements to see if my condition is worsening. I have no idea what measurements he took because I was frankly overwhelmed by the experience. For him to look at my stiff eggplant didn't seem completely implausible. After all, I couldn't see a problem unless I was at full mast. Getting me fully firm, well, that was stretching my credibility. And when he kept going until I arrived, that just didn't make any sense. I asked about this on an online urology forum and found that this is so far outside of ethical practice that nobody would take me seriously. They assumed that I was just trying to share some fantasy I'd created. Nobody believed that a urologist would act this way. I'm not gay, and if I was trying to create a fantasy, I could probably do much better than him. I'm so sorry he did that to you. There is no excuse for doing that. He betrayed your trust and disregarded your dignity and wishes. I don't know what the legal boundary is, but this feels like he could be fired for that. You didn't consent to that, and there was no appropriate reason for him to have done that. Please report him. Don't worry about whether they believe you or not, which is out of your control. If anyone else reports him, your reports will back each other's up. I just wanted to add, and you probably know this, that this was completely his fault. You trusted him to behave professionally. He shouldn't have used the toy on you. He should have left it with you, stood outside the door, and said to let him know when you were ready for him to examine you. I'm so sorry you experienced this. Went to a psychiatrist because I wanted to self-delete. He said, Well, you don't seem sad. I can't really help. You know how to spread him. I was at the gyno's office and needed to open my legs a little more in the stirrups during the examination. Wow, that's inappropriate. My mom's first gyno appointment with an elderly male doctor, she didn't really want to open her legs to him. He said, You really think you've got something down there that I haven't seen before? He turned out to be a really good doctor and my mom uses the story to remind me to not be embarrassed of crap that everyone has. Not said, but done. I was at the pediatrician having a physical. A youngish, probably late 20s to early 30s, attractive to my brain, blonde woman doctor gives me a physical. It comes time to turn my head and cough. I have become excited in anticipation. She does the whole check for hernia thing, then just before telling me I can pull my pants up, she flicks the head of my wang down with her finger, springing it like a dive board. She smiles slightly and continues on with the rest of the physical like nothing else happened. I don't know if she was trying to make my 12-year-old mind feel at ease about the embarrassing, to me anyway, situation, but I've never forgotten about that moment. During my first physical at about the same age, my female doctor counted my testes, saying, one thingy-dingy, two thingy-dingies, probably trying to put me at ease, but it was so weird and out of place. Look, I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to call you on my phone later on this evening and we'll discuss options off the book. It's my personal number, so I would appreciate it if you kept it to yourself. Highly unprofessional, but hugely helpful. Best doctor I've met, for sure. Is that unprofessional? I had a doctor who knew I suffered from terrible allergies and sinus inflammations every spring, and I was getting married. She scrounged around for pharmaceutical samples of anti-allergy and sinus medication for me, and of course didn't charge me for them, and gave me her personal number telling me to call her over the weekend if my symptoms worsened, and she'd see what else she could come up with. Turns out I didn't need it, the stuff she gave me worked great, but I appreciated the gesture. Didn't occur to me that this was unprofessional. I thought it was just going above and beyond as a doctor. I would say get a vibe check if you do get an offer like that from a doctor at the very least. That kind of situation could easily be taken in a very different and much worse direction. I'm glad it worked for both of these people. I had a positive pregnancy test and went to my OB to get a blood test confirmation. Standard practice is to repeat the blood test after 48 hours to see if your HCG levels have doubled, which indicates the pregnancy is progressing normally. About 10 minutes before my second blood draw, I received a call from my OB's office. Since I was already in the hospital parking garage at the time, I decided to just go into the office to see what the call was about. In the waiting room, full of patients, a nurse decided to tell me that I was going to lose the baby and they called me because they wanted to save me the trouble of getting my blood drawn. I made her draw my blood anyway, knowing that there was no way they could diagnose that with only half the information. Then proceeded to walk out of the office in tears in front of everyone who'd just heard what she'd told me. Sure enough, my numbers had doubled. They unfortunately continued to fluctuate after that, which indicated that I was not having a miscarriage, but an ectopic pregnancy. Undiagnosed, an ectopic pregnancy can lead to serious complications including rupture of the fallopian tube, internal bleeding, and potential death. I continued to go to that OB because my doctor was amazing, but that nurse is on my crap list forever. That nurse deserves to be fired. If everyone heard her tell you about the miscarriage, that's a massive privacy violation, in addition to her being horribly callous and an idiot. Did you tell your doctor about it? Because I'd assume most good doctors wouldn't want someone like that on their staff. 
I did tell my doctor about it in regards to the confusion it created, but in all the stress and turmoil of getting a proper diagnosis and treatment, following up on what happened to her was the last thing on my mind. My doctor was incredibly sympathetic. I haven't seen that nurse around the office since then. This happened back in January, and at about 18 weeks into a viable pregnancy at this point, I've received really wonderful care from the staff that I've interacted with this time around. If I do happen to see her roaming the hallways, I might just chew her out and blame it on the hormones. When the doctor told my dad that he had cancer in various spots, including his bladder, colon, lymph nodes, and prostate, my mum started crying, obviously. The doctor sneered at my mum and told her to get a grip. Fricking butthole. My dad's okay, by the way. Well, you're sitting here talking and smiling. You can't be that depressed, said by my psychiatrist a few years ago. Yeah, frick that. It's not hard to learn to slap on a happy face in public so people stop asking questions. I did it for years. Right? That was probably the third thing he said to me. He hasn't even asked me a question other than, why are you here today? I've had the worst luck with shrinks, too. Repeatedly asked if I could be pregnant when I was like, I have messed up periods, yo. I'm a lesbian and in a committed relationship with another woman. There's no chance in heck I could be with child, stop asking. My endocrinologist, I have hypothyroidism, is trying to figure out the messed up periods, but I've had them for ages. I badly burned my hand in the college cafeteria and went to the campus health office. I showed skin literally dripping off my hand, begging for a cream or bandage or anything to ease the pain. After making sure I wasn't allergic to anything, they asked if I was doing the deed regularly. I wasn't, but didn't see how that was relevant to my burned hand. She then moved on to my current medications. I was on an asthma inhaler, ADD meds, and birth control. She looked up at me with a smug grin and said, All right, well, if you aren't doing the deed with anyone, why are you on birth control? As if she had caught me. I yelled back in her face while clutching my blistered hand, In case the mood strikes me. Now, if that part of my life is out of the way, can you fix my hand? Women are on birth control for a lot of reasons. My ex was a virgin and took it because it relieved her cripplingly painful periods. Some women get irregular periods. That nurse is a C-word. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. My doctor is also my best friend and I routinely have to get surgery because of a medical problem. Once when he was cutting into somewhere that I couldn't see, he said, Oops. I was dating a girl for a while and we both went to the doctor to get tested for transmitted diseases. When she was done, the doctor grabs me and brings me into the room. We chatted for a bit and he says, You know, I probably wouldn't date that girl if I were you. When I was in the army, I was dating a girl. One day she calls me and tells me she had chlamydia. My tests came back negative. I was on the phone with the Navy doctor and he said, You know what this means, right? Uh, yeah? Your girlfriend that you were in a monogamous relationship with had a disease and you didn't. Yeah, I get that. Let me rephrase. She got it from somewhere that wasn't you. I got it. I'll deal with it. I mean, that's inappropriate, but looking out. Folks out there fall for the old, I caught it from a public toilet or a bus seat all the time. I mean, I don't know how I feel about that. In my mind, it might not transgress boundaries by saying, your partner has evidently got this from someone that wasn't you, but telling them to break up is outside their jurisdiction. It's not cancer. You don't need to get this checked out. I got it checked out. It was cancer. A psychiatrist told me that he didn't have time for my craziness. After lying to me for weeks, telling me that I was on the waiting list for therapy when I wasn't, I found out when I went to the psychology department that I'd been discharged without a letter to me or my GP. Next time I saw my psychiatrist, he asked me how it made me feel. I told him that it felt like no one cared and just wanted to do me off and tell me what I wanted to hear rather than check to see if what they were saying was even true. The psychiatrist said to me, That's just your depression making you feel that way. No, you butthole, it's seven weeks of you telling me I'm on a list and saying you've been checking it yourself when clearly you hadn't. Anyone would feel fobbed off. I was booked to discuss possible knee surgery with a specialist. After several years of physio and many MRIs showed an old injury is not improving. So after a long wait where literally 30 or more people who enter the waiting room after me get seen before I do, I got in the room and the first thing he tells me is that he saw I was next and then deliberately delayed my appointment by four hours because other patients were easier to sort out. That's what he actually said. So I was already teed off. He genuinely thought I should be okay with an extra four hour wait and no apology at all. Then he can't remember which knee is the issue. I told him and he glanced at the scan and said, Well, I understand women sometimes feel much more pain than men, but this is probably healed now anyway. Healed. 
Despite causing issues for seven years, it's now probably healed. He asks if the pain impacts my life. I listed all the hobbies I've given up. The trips that have been ruined, the flat shoes I had to wear as a bridesmaid because I couldn't walk in heels without crying. And he nods along. So I ask him if I need to take my shoes off for the exam, and he says that's not necessary. He'd seen my notes and doesn't think my knee has any problems, because if it did, I'd need a wheelchair. Excuse me? I was in that room less than three minutes. He didn't look at my leg. He told me if it still hurt to go up and down stairs and collapse when I tried to do squats in a year, he'd have another look. I rang my doctor immediately. I was furious. She looked over my notes. He wrote that the patient is fully healed and the injury does not affect her in any way. He actually wrote that on my medical records next to a week old MRI showing three massive tears in my tendons and abrasions on the bone. Yeah, magically healed. My doctor wanted me to go back. I've told her I will never speak to that man again and we're figuring out what to do now. One of the doctors in military recruitment post, military service in Russia is mandatory by the way, that's important, looked at me and said something like, okay, you're fine, and writes down in my file that I'm healthy. I'm like, excuse me ma'am, I recall having pretty visible scoliosis for my entire freaking life. You might want to consider checking my previous check record from two years ago in the same freaking file you're holding. To which she replies, oh, well it seems to be gone now. This is usual when teenagers grow up. Russian recruitment posts are truly miraculous places. Hundreds of thousands of diseases were cured there in just one or two health checks. Don't worry, eventually it will curve enough that it will go straight again. I'd just turned 15 and was getting a throat swab. The male doctor noticed that I'd lost my gag reflex and told me not to worry because it would come in handy for certain adult activities. I looked confused, so he repeated himself with more of an emphasis on adult. No, I wasn't confused about what you were implying, you idiot. I was confused about what made you think it was a good idea to say it. I'd known the doctor for years and he'd never said or done anything creepy before or since, so I let it slide. Saw a doctor to discuss a bout of depression I was going through a few years ago, and his diagnostic was, well, obviously it's got a lot to do with your face. Yeah, I've got some bad acne scarring, but what a crappy thing to say. Yep, that's one heck of an opening statement. I'm not sure anyone likes to begin a conversation being told they're ugly. Is there any other way to interpret it, or am I missing something? When I was a young teenager, I had a lot of problems with ovarian cysts and had several surgeries to remove them. I woke one night with severe pain and was taken to the ER, where an unfamiliar doctor performed an ultrasound to see what was going on. He was gruff and cold towards me. I was understandably nervous and afraid and feeling vulnerable, when he jabbed down on my abdomen with the ultrasound device and remarked loudly, And here we see the scars from getting your child removed at the clinic in a very judgmental tone. I'd never had that procedure, and I was just in shock and sort of laid there, silently crying, too afraid to say anything. I wish I could have had the guts to say something at the time. To think that this man was dealing with vulnerable, scared young women, the mistakes he must have made and the things he must have said to other girls, just sort of breaks my heart. What kind of doctor thinks that procedure leaves scars on the lower abdomen? I wish you could have kicked him in the throat, partially for being a jerk and partially for being incompetent. I'm not sure. I was a frightened kid in a lot of pain, and it was more his condemning tone that rattled me. This was more than 20 years ago, and I still think about all the things I should have said. When telling him one of my symptoms was that I couldn't do number two, he said, Oh, people all over the world get constipated. I had a bowel obstruction. My friend has always been paranoid about getting diabetes since both of her parents have it. She's rail thin, never had an overweight day in her life, and does long-distance running, karate, and yoga. One night, she realized she was seeing halos around any light she looked at. She asked her doctor to check for diabetes, and he laughed and said she was too thin to get diabetes. She said it ran in her family, and he said that it didn't matter. She wasn't fat, so she didn't have it. Her symptoms didn't go away, so she finally went to the hospital and demanded a blood test. She had freaking diabetes. If she wasn't so aware of the disease, who knows how far it would have progressed before her idiot doctor finally tested her. An ambulance took me to the ER of the local hospital after I was snuck up on and beaten about 30 to 40 times by my now ex-wife with a steel rod. The back end of a colk gun, to be specific. The doctor who examined me in the ER was a very small, older, Filipino woman who barely looked at my injuries and was more interested in telling me that I had no reason to be there. You're a big, strong man. Why you not stop her? Why you not run away? You're fine, you're fine. Lady no hurt, man. When the forensic nurse came in to take the photos for the police report, the doctor shooed her away. He doesn't need you. He's fine. He's fine. She refused to take x-rays or do a CT scan. I was hit in the head a few times and sent me home with no medication or follow-up instructions. 
I found out later when I got myself to a real doctor that she broke the law by not allowing the forensic nurse to do her job, and that I should have had x-rays and a CT scan, because I had three broken ribs, a separated shoulder, and a skull fracture that caused some brain injuries. As far as I know, she got no reprimand or punishment for it, and the judge allowed my ex-wife to plea bargain down to offensive touching because of the lack of forensic evidence. Just the other day, I was getting my 20-week scan and the doctor said, Looks like baby has a cute dinky little nose, unlike his mom's schnoz. It's not so bad, but I'm a little conscious about my big nose, so I thought that was rude. But I'm glad the baby doesn't have my nose. Another time I was in hospital for a miscarriage, and a nurse had to clean up the blood and she loudly said she'd rather be in the nursery than doing this. That was heartbreaking because me too, B-word. My GP had a weekly checkup with my father for years due to him having heart issues. Simple assessment to see if everything was stable. He saw him every single week. He saw him losing about 10 kilos, 24 pounds, as well. Never advised a single extra thing and said he was fine. That was until we forced my father to go to the hospital for a detailed checkup. But the GP says I'm fine. Where he passed away a week later. He was in the terminal phase of lung cancer. A fricking lung cancer that had been eating away at him for months, yet the GP didn't even bother noticing anything. I still can't believe this. I went to get checked for transmissibles after I was a victim of the unspeakable act. She was asking me about the experience, if I knew the person, and if anyone else was home. Yes, it was a family member, and one person was asleep upstairs. She asked me why I didn't scream to wake up the person, with a matter-of-fact look on her face. Yeah, you're right, I should have done that. Stupid me for letting it happen, B-word. I never went back there. I was refused birth control once because apparently it's a decision my husband needed to be present for because we could want kids. Nothing permanent, just birth control. Jesus. Two occasions, same moron doctor. I was like 12 and I got a skin infection in my back and he just blatantly told me that it was that disease where fish have to eat the dead skin and that it had no cure and it was going to get a lot worse. Being a kid, I was heartbroken by that, especially when told in such a blunt way. Anyways, my mum took me to another hospital and they were shocked at how dumb the other guy was. Obviously wrong diagnosis, it was something really easy to treat, and how he could just blurt that out to a kid. What's the pettiest thing a parent has complained about to their kid's school? For silly fun at the end of the term, I showed an episode of Mr. Bean. He was washing his clothes and pulled out a dress accidentally and put it on. That is what the parents were mad at, that I was encouraging cross-dressing. They were seniors in high school, by the way. They were seniors in high school, and now they're an all-cross-dressing, traveling cabaret. And that's your doing, you wonderfully corrupt show business pixie. In my college gender studies class, the first big paper could be skipped if you cross-dressed for a day. I only know one or two people who chose to actually write the paper. My brother is a high school teacher. He had one kid that was early accepted into college of his choice and decided that his entire senior year could be the frick you all year. My brother had multiple conversations with the parents throughout the year about the fact that the student was failing, as did other teachers. Parents seemed very unconcerned by this. The day before classes ended, my brother runs into the father out in public, and the father says to him, I'm very concerned about the students, really. I think his school performance this year doesn't bode well for how he's going to do in college. My brother said, Your son isn't going to college. He has to repeat at least five classes this year in order to get his diploma. What? No, he's already accepted. Yes, but that's all conditional. Without his high school diploma, which we've been telling you all year he's not going to get, he can't get in. The father, who has a college degree himself, was apparently shocked by this news and then promptly went right to the school board trying to get his entire senior year waived because he was obviously such a strong student that a school accepted him on early admission. The school board did not agree. The counselors at my school have this big meeting for all the seniors after the typical early admissions date where they tell horror stories of people getting rescinded. It works pretty well. Parents once complained that I let my 7th grade intermediate ESL students read a story that was a whole 22 pages long, with images for their book report. They had more than a month to read it. It was an edited copy for their level. How could you, you monster? 22 pages is too much for any child. Honestly, even as someone who speaks their second language on a daily basis, the idea of reading a 22-page book is kind of daunting to me, even if I could do it in, you know, a day or so. But I am a dummy, and it's probably good for an official curriculum for these kids. I hate parents that prevent their kids from testing their limits. 
The first year living in the US, I had a social studies final assignment on the Civil War. It was a total of about 20 essays, each about a page long, double-spaced. Not extremely difficult for your average student, but it seemed impossible to me and other kids in my ESL class. I'd taken English classes before moving to the US, but I would compare it to an English speaker taking Spanish 1. You can say hi and ask for a bathroom, but you can't really have a conversation with anyone. I was the only kid from my ESL class that managed to turn in the entire assignment. Both my ESL and social studies teachers were impressed. I'm sure it was crap, but I felt so proud to have completed it. Most of the other kids in my class took advantage of the circumstances and turned in two or three pages max, since the teacher had said to turn in what we could because she understood we were in ESL. I witnessed a parent complaining at the end of a primary school concert that it wasn't fair that their child had no discernible musical talent and that the school should stop giving instrument lessons to kids who were keen or talented. I've never seen the music teacher genuinely speechless for so long. My special snowflake can't play a triangle so nobody gets to play a triangle. <sighs> she was angry that her child got lice in elementary school. Apparently, it was all my fault that her child got infected. After they got the lice out, the mum was adamant that her daughter not be hugged by anyone, or that she shouldn't get too close, but also never specified what too close actually was for me to attempt to enforce. All this so that she didn't get infected again. This is first grade. Trying to keep kids away from each other is like herding cats. This same parent complained to me that I was calling her child by a shortened version of her name, that the child asked me to use. These are just from this year. My kids all got lice in elementary school last year and I still didn't blame anyone. I just muttered while combing out their hair for like the billionth time. I hate lice. I have my students wash their hands before lunch. Apparently, I'm being unrealistic with my expectations. Get effed, Dawn. Back when I used to teach, I had a parent once complain that my classroom was too quiet and as a consequence her daughter and her peers got too much work done and they felt it was bad for their daughter's brain to be learning so much so quickly. Even worse, I had to sit in a meeting between them and my head of faculty to discuss it. Multiple times my head of faculty had to clarify that they were actually complaining that their daughter was being taught too well. I bet it just made the parents insecure that their kid might be smarter than them. A parent called to complain that I hadn't put her daughter's late homework into the gradebook yet. I told her, I can't put the homework in the gradebook until she actually turns it in. This parent just kept asking me why I hadn't put it in. I kept replying with, I have nothing to put in, she hasn't given it to me. Finally, the call ended with, ugh, some people just don't know how to do their jobs. For everyone saying I should just put in a zero, I would have if I'd been allowed to. The school didn't allow teachers to put zeros in for assignments until the end of semester. So instead, I called parents every time there was an incomplete assignment and reminded them that it would become a zero in a few weeks. Occasionally, I would put in a zero for a few days to scare a kid into getting an assignment done, but only if I knew that it would work. My cousin who teaches kindergarten had a parent complain to the principal that she was irresponsible for being selfish enough to have a baby and take maternity leave before the end of the school year. Most of my colleagues who are mothers have heard a version of this. Last year, a parent complained that I was missing school too much and it was negatively affecting her child's learning. My mom spent a month in the hospital and died. I missed eight days. I had a girl in an honors class. She earned a B+. The mother asked if she could be bumped up. Cases where it's pretty darn close to an A, I'll consider it, but she was at the low end of a B+. During the semester, she changed classes and is now in the same class with a different teacher. She didn't ask to be transferred, but that's just how her schedule happened to work out. I got an email two months later from the parents telling me how much better the review packets are that the other teacher gives, and how the other teacher spreads apart the test dates to be more comfortable for the students, and that the student was doing much better in the other class. She asked again if I could change the grades to an A. Those would be valid criticisms if it were not for the fact that I gave the exact same reviews as the other teacher and we scheduled tests on the exact same day. On top of that, I asked what the student currently had in that class. Oh, B+. Oh my god, she tried negging you. I wonder if she thought because she herself was vain enough for it to work on her that it would work on you. Gosh darn, focus all your vitriol on your kids if you want them to pass, parents. Or maybe it's a good thing that all this toxic stupidity isn't directed at their offspring 24-7. My mother's a high school teacher and this is one of her stories. The kid turns 18 and joins the military. The mother goes ballistic, storms into the school, yelling at everyone, well, just the staff, saying that this was all the school's fault, that he was corrupted into joining and things like that. 
demands to talk to the kid's teacher, my mum, and my mum says, this seems like a talk you should be having with your kid, not me. The lady goes ballistic again. Mum has to call the AP to escort her out of the building. After hearing that, no wonder the kid wanted to join right after high school. One of my students was the child of a co-worker. Both were huge pains in the butt. Co-worker's mother stormed into the class after school to complain that her son had earned a C plus or a B minus, I can't remember, on a homework assignment the week before. She was upset that I hadn't contacted her. I explained that I always immediately entered grades into a system that parents had access to online. Parents could view grades and that school calendar, etc. The school employee who maintained the site? It was her. So she knew how to use it. The co-worker's mother demanded that I contact her personally whenever her son made less than an A, and got upset when I said that I wouldn't. I told her I didn't have the time, I had the work of two teachers. An email wouldn't take long for me to send, but I didn't want to give myself yet another thing to remember, then risk getting chewed out for forgetting, and risk all of the other parents wanting the same useless courtesy. I said I'd contact her if I noticed a trend of slipping grades, which wasn't the issue with her son. His grades were great overall. This teed her off no end. I said that accessing the site took the same number of clicks it'd take to access an email about the grades, so there was no point. She cried, yelled, and kept pushing and threatened to take this to the principal, who was her best friend. I finally said that if I could keep track of all the grades for the three grade levels I taught, surely she could handle keeping track of grades for one kid. Just one incident of many with my beady-eyed witch of a co-worker. This reminds me of a parent I had to deal with just recently. Her son is a good kid, but not a good student. His grades are terrible. His mother emailed me saying that he isn't responsible and asked me to email her the agenda and homework personally every day. Luckily, I have a class website, which they were told about and upload the agenda, homework, and handouts daily, and just referred her to the site. I still can't understand how she thought that was a reasonable request. I guess that's easier than having a conversation with her kid and helping him become responsible. The bottom of a T. She wanted me to force her daughter to write the letter T as it appears in typing. She scheduled a parent-teacher meeting about it. Did you follow her instructions to a T? No, I told my boss that I'm not a calligraphy teacher and I didn't attend the meeting. The situation seems to have resolved itself. The color of red pen I use. Apparently, it's too dark of a red to be considered red, and if I can't do my job properly using the correct red, I'm unqualified to teach. A dark red pen? I can't believe that people like you are allowed around our children. What if the children see it and confuse it for blood and grow up to become vampires? Ted Bundy only killed people because he couldn't get over the fact that his grade 4 teacher used too dark of a red pen. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. A parent complained to a teacher when their child fell on the playground and the clothes got muddy and scratched up. They wanted the school to pay for new clothing. They fell on the pavement which had mud on it since it had rained the day before. The child also didn't hurt themselves, they just got the clothing dirty and scratched a bit when he fell. I had a screaming parent in my office because of a marginal comment I made on an essay that had received a grade of 95%, submitted by a student who was top of the class. The comment said, and I'm paraphrasing here, This argument is unworthy of you. Don't be lazy. Find better sources and don't hang your argument on idle assertions. The parent claimed I had called her daughter lazy, idle, fat, mentally ill, and unworthy of being a student at my institution. She actually thought I was threatening to have her expelled or at least barred from grad school. The best part? The girl was a second year undergraduate. The next best part? It was an open office and my colleagues were openly mocking her the entire time. I just sat there and said nothing. I miss those guys. Just to be clear because of potential pronoun confusion, the female student had no problem with the comment and was absolutely mortified by what her mother had done and seriously concerned that the interference would damage her academic career. I just laughed and told her I was even more impressed that she'd emerged intelligent and sane from a home environment like that, then asked if she needed any letters of reference. She did and she got them. Her mother got a vaguely insulting note and a small tray of milk chocolates. It seems infinitely more fun to be a professor or doctor purely in that you have a lot more leeway to be sassy to overbearing would-be authority figures, especially once you have tenure. I did a class secret center with my choir. Before they were allowed to draw names, they had to bring back a signed form from the parents promising that they'll actually buy the other child a gift. This is eighth grade. One girl didn't buy a gift. I called the parents twice. 
Both times, her mother told me in a worried voice that didn't inspire confidence that yes, of course she'd get a gift. She never did, so one kid in class who signed up never got a gift. Her mother went absolutely ballistic. Called me, called my principal, insisted we had to make this parent go get her child a gift. I'd already planned to go out and buy her child a gift with my own meager salary, but she told me I wasn't allowed to do so because I had to make this other parent do it. I told her I can't drive to this other parent's house, drag her to the mall, and force her to buy a gift. I simply can't. It's out of my hands. My admin backed me up. She continued to rail at me for another week. I stopped doing Secret Santa after that. My mom was accused of doing witchcraft in the classroom when she told her kids a chant to make a snow day. The chant can only be done if the snow is in the forecast and the students get all of their homework done. The chant is, Salami Salami Bologna Let It Snow. She just wanted her kids to do their homework. I had a parent complain that her kid was wearing a tight spaghetti strap tank top because the kid got hot and took off her sweater. The mum yelled at me for what she dressed her kid in. Because the conversation went like this. Daughter gets in the car with the parent not wearing the sweater. You wore that to school? Oh my god, mum, chillax. The teacher said it was fine. You're overreacting. A parent went to the school district over the fact that I wouldn't let her come into my class because she wanted to give her daughter a bracelet that would have completed her outfit. This was back when I taught the third grade. A music student of mine refused to sing one of her lessons in class because she had difficulty reading her bass clef. Her parents came to complain that it's not fair that I'm singling their daughter out because how is she supposed to know this clef? Well, this is her final year in Solfege, so... Not replacing the novel, the entire ninth grade was assigned with a novel more aligned with her Mormon values. What was the novel in the syllabus and what was her demand? I need closure on this lunacy. The absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian. It has a bit of racy romantic content, which was her main issue. I was teaching 7th and 8th grade at a Catholic school and a group of mums came in and complained that their sons were distracted by my butt and that I needed to do something about it. For the record, my teaching wardrobe is variations of conservative dresses straight out of the 1950s. Most awkward meeting ever. What do you even say to something like that? Yes, I shall deflate my butt in consideration. I basically said that, actually. I refused to push the review test and subsequent lessons after the test back because her parents wanted to take her out of school for a week to go on vacation. This was about two weeks after the winter break, mind you. Only have so much time to teach the entirety of World War I. They couldn't wrap their head around it and kept saying that I was trying to make it so their kid failed. My wife teaches at a school that uses class dojo. It does a lot of different things, but it is essentially a behavioral management system. She can give kids points for doing the right thing and can take points away if they do the wrong thing. The parents who sign up for notifications get them sent straight to their phone or computer. She had one student this year who was refusing to do work and was being disrespectful to the student teacher. She was basically telling the student teacher that she wasn't really a teacher and that she, the student, didn't have to listen to her, the student teacher. My wife overheard what was going on and took away a point for disrespect. The girl's parents came in the next day and the dad was demanding that my wife change the disrespectful point. He didn't mind that his daughter lost a point, but he was teed off that she lost a point for being disrespectful. He told her that a seven-year-old isn't capable of disrespect and insisted that this was going to ruin her chances of getting into Stanford because they would see her as a disrespectful person. My wife explained that this information is simply a way to track behavior and communicate with the parents. It has nothing to do with a permanent record, it's just an app. The dad continued to demand that it be changed and my wife eventually relented. She changed it to a refusal to work point instead. I'm not sure if Stanford thinks being lazy is better than being disrespectful, but the dad seemed to think so. My mother forced me to go to my 6th grade social studies teacher and ask her why I'd missed half a point on a 16-point assignment. That's 97%. I assume your mother's logic went something like this. Failed life must achieve through children. I had a parent try to excuse her son's lack of homework completion as too hard for little boys. It was identifying nouns in a year nine class. At my old school, a parent complained to the principal that her child's punishment was too severe because when he exposed himself in class, it was just the berries and not the twig. That I gave their child a detention for saying something foul in Spanish. I guess they just didn't like this gringo calling their child out for the stuff they were saying. Admins caved to the parents and I was less than amused. 
Not a teacher, but I recall that my daughter's second grade teacher got in trouble with another parent during the Iraq war by referring to Saddam Hussein in class as Saddam Insane. That parent was anti-Bush and anti-war and assumed that the teacher was some kind of right-wing Republican. I'm not sure of the teacher's politics, but he was an African-American gay man. The controversy blew over pretty quickly. This was in San Francisco, so yeah. Not a parent, but a college student. She told me she deserves to get rounded up to an A. Now, she had a lot of absences, never participated in class discussions, and didn't improve at all over the course of the semester. Oh, and she also had an 84. You know, five points away from rounding range. When she wasn't rounded up, she sent an email saying that she didn't care about the class. She cares about getting into medical school, a dream that I've now ruined. She signed the email, Your grace will be rewarded. Karma. When I was in middle school, I got something like 8 or 9 hours of detention for some stupid thing I did. My mum kept telling the teacher that it was not enough and that he should increase my detention time for one whole month that I know of. I still pity my teacher. I dread awards day as an elementary school teacher. I had a parent complain that their child didn't get an academic award. I made sure that every child got something, whether it be for an academic subject like reading, writing, math, social studies or science or just for their awesome personality. I can't remember what her child got, but it was one of those personality awards. He was a very cheerful, sweet kid, but she said that this award sent the message that academics weren't important or that he wasn't smart. With over 120 kids in that grade level, it was impossible to give everyone an academic award. He had a chance to win one. If he read a certain amount of books, you would win a reading award. But you actually had to keep track of that at home and turn the paper back into me, which he didn't. So, I'll just say that this wasn't the first time she'd complained about something petty that year. I once had a parent accuse me and the admins of a conspiracy against her daughter. I had her in my class period and she always skipped, so I always marked her absent. She couldn't believe that her precious snowflake could be skipping. A parent from a rival school once complained to my teacher that I was too big to be playing sixth grade basketball. Must have been held back a few years were her exact words. Jokes on her, though, the teacher was my mum and promptly informed her that I was the youngest kid in my class by several months. I just had a tall father and a very early series of growth spurts. I got chewed out for expecting a 12-year-old to be able to read an analog clock. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories, or if you want some vibey music to put on in the background, check out Easy Mode. If you like Am I the Genius, give Am I the Jerk a shot. Everything linked in the description.